Um, welcome to, to our, uh, our workshop today, which as you all know, no doubt, is titled Archaeology at a Crossroads, New Approaches to Understanding Early Southeast Asian Polities. Um, I also want to open with thanking our funders, of course, and our hosts. So the Alpha Wood Foundation funded Southeast Asian Art Academic Program at SOAS and the SOAS Center for Southeast Asian Studies. You will see our branding on either side here. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank one of our most ardent supporters, uh, who is Professor Ian Glover, who many of you know and who many of you know also passed away quite recently. This is the first SOAS Southeast Asian Art and Archaeology research event, um, or event through the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, that will be held after Ian's passing. And this is the first in my memory that uh, Ian Glover has not attended, actually. So um, I think he will be present in all of our minds, particularly as we talk about this, um, the question of archaeology as a privileged site of, um, of knowledge of early Southeast Asian polities. So I just wanted to, to allow us all to recall that and to remember him. Now, before introducing our speakers and our respondents, I also want to set today's event in, in a, a broader, shall we say, institutional but also disciplinary context. Um, 2017-18, this is the present academic year, marks the fourth year of the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program at SOAS, and it's the fourth year of a bespoke Southeast Asian Art and Archaeology research event series run by um, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies and funded by SAP, as it is called in its acronym. And so it is the fourth in a series which is explicitly devoted to the remit of SAP, which I will give to you to give you a sense of the context. Um, the remit is Southeast Asian Buddhist and Hindu art and architecture from ancient to pre-modern times, including study of the built environment, sculpture, painting, illustrated texts, textiles, and other tangible or visual representations, along with the written word related to these, and archaeological, museum, and cultural heritage studies. So over the past few years, we've developed a two-pronged approach to this Center for Southeast Asian Studies research event program, which is funded through, um, through the SAP program itself. First of all, in the teaching terms, the very busy teaching terms of terms one and two, we host individual research talks by scholars external to this institution, external to SOAS. This, this series of talks is integrated into the regular weekly series of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Um, where we indeed invite people um, every Wednesday to speak, so I hope that all of you are um, regular <coughs> attendees um, of that program. Um, then in term three, where we are now, we host the more substantial research workshops in which we bring together multiple scholars, um, trying to put people into conversation on selected themes which we see to be of particular import in the field of Southeast Asian art and ar archaeology today. So. First, we, we aim quite simply to promote research in this field with a particular orientation to supporting Southeast Asian scholars in developing and disseminating research. And secondly, we aim to examine in a more synthetic fashion, a more critically synthetic fashion, um, we aim to examine the state of the field of Southeast Asian art and archaeology. And in this, we're, we have developed a particular orientation to supporting reflection on methodologies in the field, past and present, and future, shall I say. Um, the collaborative workshop format is designed especially to enable us to uh, advance in some fashion towards this latter goal. Um, more broadly, I would say that with this two-pronged research, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies program seeks to align the SAP research remit, which I just gave to you, with its more practical dimensions of enabling development of work on the region by regional scho scholars without, nonetheless, um, essentializing the latter. That is, we aim to recognize, detect, explore, um, specificity of perspectives of Southeast Asian scholars while all the while recognizing the international nature of what we call Southeast Asian scholars today as well as the necessity and the complex nature of international exchange at the heart of the SAP remit. So that's a mouthful but that's where we're headed. Um, another way of thinking about this or to sort of take a step 
a bit further back, is that we also to align, we also aim to align the SAP specific work with the SOAS institutional remit of decolonizing scholarship in and on what we still seem to call here at least our regions at large. So um, one last note on the means by which we seek to reach these uh, indeed lofty goals. Um, so the SAP Research and Publications Group is currently launching two publishing initiatives. Um, in the first instance, a postgraduate res research journal, um, which is called Bratu. It's co-edited by uh, a, a group of SOAS PhD students. I will name them and thank them publicly here. Heidi Tan, Ben Rayford, Ben Rayford, Udamla Hunchakun, and Zuyen Nguyen. Um, and I also would like just to take the opportunity to tell all of you that we have, we're just launching it now, we have, uh, info, we have a web page, we have information on the journal and the, the, the first call for papers, and we have that information available here, so please feel free to come up and, and take this. Um, we are also launching a book series with uh, National University of Singapore Press. The book series is, t is entitled Southeast Asian Art and Archaeology, Hindu Buddhist Traditions. Uh, these are not venues for self-publishing, may I say. We are not, I'm not looking to channel everything that we're doing here into our own publication series. Um, we hope that these will work together, um, but these are, these are forum. We consider each of these initiatives as, specific, as a specific forum for supporting uh, the development of research and particularly, um, as one would think, the dissemination um, of research in this field. So um, now let me turn to our speakers. I have to turn to different directions um, today. First of all, to thank uh, both of you for your enthusiasm in accepting uh, to contribute your time and your knowledge today. We um, very much appreciate it. Um, before I say a little bit about you, I'll say a little bit about the, um, the event itself. The workshop today starts with the premise that the expansion of archaeological work in mainland Southeast Asia over um, the recent decades has nurtured increasingly refined understandings of the emergence of political cultural entities um, in their interactions across the broader Southeast, East, and South Asian region. Um, an increasing amount of intellectual attention is being paid to interpretive frameworks and this has likewise contributed to critiques of the colonialist and the nationalist dimensions of much of the extant work on early Southeast Asian polities. And it's making way for explorations, for new kinds of explorations of networks, of shared practices and objectives, and as well as exploration of competing claims to territorial, political, and cultural hegemonies, then and now, again. So um, our two speakers today are both making uh, an incisive contribution to the development of this area of work in Southeast Asian art and archaeology. So Dr. Sam Nunsuk, uh, who will be our first speaker, he currently holds the post of Senior Specialist at SPAFA in Simeo um, in Bangkok, so the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts Bangkok. All of you probably know SPAFA. Um, he is an archaeologist and an art, art historian specializing in Peninsular Thailand and maritime Southeast Asia. His talk will examine the long history of Peninsular Thailand, exploring new perspectives on the early socio-cultural network of the principalities around the Gulf of Siam. Now, I'm here to promote not just my own institution, but also uh, Sam's work. So we have a, um, a, a book which is closely related to the work that he will be presenting today, and which uh, Sam Nunsuk has, has uh, edited. And we actually do have a few copies for sale. Um, for those of you who are interested, please do speak with our speaker during, during uh, the break. Okay. Um, Dr. Nang Kim uh, is our second speaker. He is currently associate professor at the Department of Archaeology, the University of Wisconsin at Madison in the US. He is an anthropologi anthropological archaeologist interested in socio-political complexity early forms of cities and the relationship between modern politics, cultural heritage, and the archaeological record. Uh, he is also interested in the evolution and cultural context of organized violence and warfare. I won't be uh, promoting any specific book, but there are a number um, that I think many of you are already familiar with, but uh, a recent publication also on that particular topic. 
Um, much of his recent research has been geographically focused on East and Southeast Asia, and he currently conducts archaeological field work in Vietnam at the Koloa settlement of the Red River Delta. Um, and I believe we will be hearing about uh, that research today. I'm also very happy to be able to welcome and to thank also our panel of respondents today. Our respondents include Pipat Kachai Jun, uh, Ben Rayford, and Dr. Pamela Corey. So Pipat Kachai Jun is a lecturer in the history faculty of Tamasat University, Bangkok. Uh, he completed his MA in art and archaeology at SOAS uh, with Alpha Wood support a few years ago and uh, immediately received a Thai government scholarship in order to pursue a PhD also here at SOAS. He's currently in his first PhD year. He's working on a project entitled Deconstructing the Historical Meta Narrative of Thai Art and Archaeology The Emergence of Artistic Styles in the Pre Ayutthaya Period, or Utong Art. This is a project which is also fundamentally concerned with the interpretation of archaeological and art historical data at the heart of histories of early Southeast Asian polity and narratives of national origins. Ben Rayford also completed an MA in History of Art and Archaeology at SOAS before embarking on the PhD. He is currently in his final year and due to submit very shortly a substantial dissertation entitled Seeing the Foreigner in Art from Early Southeast Asia uh, circa 100 BCE to circa 800 of the Common Era. Um, based on the exhaustive, I think, compilation and meticulous formal and technical analysis of analysis materials which have long been deemed by art historians and archaeologists to represent foreigners in early Southeast Asian art. Ben's dissertation is otherwise concerned with perceptions and projections of origins, borders, distances, and localities as possibly revealed in the art itself, but also as revealed in the art historiographical record on these materials developed from the colonial period to uh, the present day. Dr. Pamela Corey is a lecturer in Southeast Asian art at SOAS. Combining the best of area studies and art historical training, Dr. Corey is a specialist of modern and contemporary Southeast Asian art with a deep historical knowledge of the Southeast Asian region at large, a sustained specialist focus on Vietnam and Cambodia, and an incisive theoretical outlook on the key questions that we will be discussing today namely the roles of art in Southeast Asian experiences of origins, the place of art and archaeology in the construction of Southeast Asian polity, and the methods by which we art historians and archaeologists of Southeast Asia have shaped and continue to shape understandings of the Southeast Asian region. Um, lastly, I want to apologize, I want to convey apologies to all of you um, from Zuyen Nguyen, who due to personal reasons was unable to complete field work in, in Vietnam as originally planned in order to make it back to London to participate in our workshop today. So she will not be joining us um, on our panel. Um, so let me tell you about the format of today. I understand that a number of the students and even non-students have other obligations, need to get out to go to class, come back in, that sort of thing. Do not worry. You can come and go, not exactly as you please, but that is possible. But let me tell you about our breaks so that you might be able to time your, your, um, your own time accordingly. Uh, so our first speaker will uh, speak for approximately 45 minutes. We'll have a short five minute stretch your legs break, then we will move to our second speaker, um, at which we, who will also speak for about 45 minutes, then we will have a 15 minute break. So that brings us to uh, just around four o'clock, okay? We'll have a, a 15 minute break. We'll then reset up the room as we can in order to have our panel discussion. Each of our respondents will be um, giving something like a 10 minute response to the papers. Then our speakers will respond to them and then we open up the floor for questions. Afterwards, we have a reception uh, in the room next door. So please do uh, make it a marathon day and stay all the way through if you possibly can. We're, we'd be very happy to also have the informal, um, the opportunity to speak together informally, and we're very lucky to have um, all of these people together in one room, so I hope that you will all be able to take the opportunity to, to speak with, with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis as well. Um, so I think that's it from me. Please join me in welcoming our speakers and our respondents today, and we will move to Dr. Nunzel. Thank you.
So first of all, I would like to thank um, Professor Ashley Thompson for inviting me here. And I would like to thank Pam, my own friend, Ben, my own friend, Professor Nam, and Ajahn Pipat as well. It has been a long time since I see him at Silapakorn University. We have only one archaeology school in Thailand. And both of us went there <laughs> in different years, so, uh, one year apart. So today I would like to introduce you to um, a region that I worked uh, on for a long time. I was born there as well. Uh, the first, I mean, I would like to talk about the objectives of today's talk. I will be quick because we have 45 minutes. Um, the first objective is to explore the socio-political, I mean socio-cultural and artistic development and the social roles of artworks in Peninsula Thailand. Um, I will use archaeological record as well because I have my background in archaeology, uh, anthropology and art history. So the, it, it will be interdip, interdisciplinary uh, approach in nature of this talk. And the second one is to link this area and its art to the Gulf of Siam and Maritime Southeast Asia. I will propose that for the, I mean the third one. I will propose that the Gulf of Siam was an important neighborhood of water and half of trade and artistic development at the end. So um, first, when we talk about Southeast Asia, when we talk about Peninsula Thailand, um, we have to talk about geography first, because geography is a twin sister of the art. Um, I mean, it, this area captures almost all of the artistic traditions in maritime Asia because of its geography. It's an inescapable fact of geography that the maritime trade will have to pass through this area, more or less. I mean, this is the area that I work on, and then this is the this more or less the South China Sea that all the traffic from west to east and east to west have to pass through more or less. We have known of the, the Silk Road before, but I mean scholars in the past focus, I mean the, the, the public as well, focus on the overland route, not the, the spice route down below. But what I'm saying is that these two routes connected the world in the ancient time and they're both equally important. And my work is focusing on the Southern Road. Um, sometimes we call it Maritime Silk Road, sometimes we call it Spice Road. Um, and these kinds of interaction, <laughs> of course, has to depend on the monsoon winds. Monsoon winds is a seasonal winds. We have to take that into account as well in terms of geography because um, you know, before the engines, before the world with the, the, the the machine, uh, um, the, the chips, all of the chips in the world were, were using uh, the wind power. So these kinds of uh, interaction, these kinds of connection were dictated by the wind, uh, the monsoon winds that, that come and goes in, in a certain ways. And these monsoon winds link the region all together. We call it monsoon Asia. Paul Moose called it monsoon Asia. He was the first to talk about this. And in this monsoon Asia, uh, people share not just the wind patterns, the, 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 the geography, I mean the, the climate, but also the kinds of you know, topography, the kinds of uh, environment, the, the natural, uh, the tropical kinds of areas, um, the, the patterns of agriculture, I mean it dictates the, the patterns of life, the circle of life, and also um, influence the kinds of uh, religions as well. Paul Moose call it monsoon Asia and monsoon religion. Monsoon religion would be, I mean, um, would be emphasized on the uh, on the on the power of the soil, uh, the earth god he call it. So in this area, I mean, tied together by the wind pattern, tied together by the geography, the land mass, the the sea uh, routes and and uh, the navigational patterns, and also the belief system as well. And the people who come and go, and then they have a, a same kinds of chair belief system based on the earth god, based on the fertility, based on the power of the soil that's coming up, and, and, and express itself in, the, in terms of um, big trees, boulders, rocks, and so on and so forth. We have examples of that all around Southeast Asia and also monsoon Asia. From India, now to southern China, 
you know, including Southeast Asia as well. So that cause of Chai belief system um, was the basis of Hinduism, Buddhism. I mean, now Buddhism reject that. You know, we we are not part of animism, but it actually have the the basis in animism too. So all of these uh, made Southeast Asian people received, uh, I believe, this kinds of you know foreign lang foreign uh, li religions like Buddhism and Hinduism quite um, quite readily because it's the same. I mean, they have the same basis. They don't look at these kinds of foreign uh, religions as something foreign. It's something that they have shared the the the, the same foundations with. Uh, already, and we don't look at it as something that we received. It's, it's not something that the, the Indian people came into to this area and then give it to us like the, the kinds of uh, Indianization concept anymore. We look at it as a localization process that the South Asian people select uh, these kinds of religions and belief system and arts to uh, the area to serve our needs to serve the people, the indigenous needs, to, to answer some of the questions that we have to, to fulfill some of the requirements that we face at that time. Looking more closely to this area, you see it clearly, hopefully. Um, this is Peninsula Thailand. Peninsula Thailand can be separated from the, Malay from the lower part of the Malay Peninsula or Peninsula Malaysia by the geography as well. Peninsula Thailand, or, or uh, we call the Isthmus of uh, Southeast Asia sometimes. Uh, we call it uh, the Isthmian track sometimes, because it's a, it's a part that people can cross from one coast to the next quite easily, I mean more easily than, than the lower part of the peninsula. Because the lower part you can see is, forest, is heavily uh, forested and mountainous. It's, it's quite difficult to, to cross. The last possible route would be from uh, the Bujang Valley in Kedah, Malaysia, to Yarang in Patani in, in Thailand. So this is part of Thailand nowadays, and that's part of Malaysia nowadays, uh, separated by this mountain range called Sankarakiri. However, I mean, the main point that I want to, uh, to talk to you is that um, this area has mountains as backbone. And then with mountains as backbones, you of course have uh, small water, short rivers on both sides that people can use to use these uh, short rivers to cross from one side to the next uh, using this one and then cross just a bit of uh, the, the mountain range, uh, the top, uh, the, the, uh, the ridge of the mountain range to the next and then take another river down to another coast. So this uh, geography allows this area to become part of the crossroads in the world civilizations, in the world navigational uh, expeditions, in the ancient times, probably before the Straits of Malacca even uh, used uh, at that time. So we have the most ancient um, site on both sides of the peninsula, and these sites were the most ancient, probably, I mean, the earliest uh, trading, what do you call it, trading stations, or, or some of them would call it like port cities, even. It's huge. Say like Khao Sam Ke or Phu Khao Tong. I will talk about that a bit uh, as well later on. But they're on both sides, and uh, the earliest one that we have as an example in Southeast Asia, another one would be Okkel. And, and the race in the we have other sites as well, but not as big as the ones that we have in uh, Peninsula Thailand. So this is a chronology in Peninsula Thailand. I will not talk a lot about this, but I will focus on the Iron Age, the early historic period, and the late historic period. From around uh, 500 BCE. The first item that we would like to talk about is the bronze drums. Uh, Professor Nam Kim would probably talk about that as well later on, but I will touch on a bit. The bronze drums that we have here, um, I mean, my professor, Professor Stanley J. O'Connor at Cornell, uh, believe that it's, it's, it reflects uh, some kinds of a common vision. Because when you look at the distribution of these bronze drums, that's an example from Khao Samkhya in Chumpon, 
It's a small one, but we have the big one too. Uh, some of them as big as one meter in, in diameter, so it's, it's monumental in size. And look at the concentration of these bronze drums. Uh, we can see that in the Gulf of Siam, we have this concentration. It's like it's in, it was spread all over the place around the Gulf of Siam as well, not on the Andaman coast, not, not that. We have it in other sites too, but we have seen the concentration of this in this particular area too. So uh, we may have seen a kind of uh, a neighborhood that you know tied together. You know they were probably caught up together in a shared vision, looking and listening to the bronze drums as well. And um, when we talk about bronze drums in the past. People would focus on, you know, looking at this as a kind of prestige goods, some kinds of things to express the power of the chief, some <coughs> kinds of things to show the status of the leader. But um, people, I mean, scholars have not talked a lot about the meanings of it. I mean, the cosmic religion, is it something that we share in common in the past, something related to the skies with the iconography of it? And we can touch on that a bit here. So when you look at the bronze drums, this is a kind of you know uh, interpretation. It's not the it's not the fact, but I mean we if 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 we cannot imagine, I mean the world is not like it, it's not so um, uh, a kind of a thoughtful place to live in. But I would like to exercise this kind of you know uh, uh, kind of imagination a bit. When you look at this, you can see that the bronze drums were separated into three parts. One, two, three. For example, this can be represented as a, a, the, the a three party, the the th the the the, the, tri the three divisions of the cosmology of the indigenous cosmology that I, I will talk about a bit too. Uh, and when you look at the tympanum of it, you see the stars or the sun in the middle, expanding all around with uh, the rings of happenings, with the things going on. And then at the end you have the frogs, so on and so forth. So this looks like uh, a kind of uh, cosmology, a cosmic legend that you know you believe you look at the stars and the sun. And this is just one of the iconography that reflect the indigenous uh, perception. That we have other examples all around. I mean, in the modern world as well, in ethnic uh, uh, arts and in 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 in, in uh, indigenous communities in, with the house and all that. Looking in the house, for example, from Sulawesi, the, the Tanaturaja, you can see the three parts of the houses, the, of the constructions. The first part would be uh, dedicated to the ancestral gods, the ancestors, the dead one that we have, the, the, the gods, the deities from above, you know, the skies, the birds and all that. The second part is the, the, the place where you live for the human, the living ones. And the lower one is the, for the, you know, the upper world uh, deities as well. So these three uh, parts of the chronologies can be, I mean, these three parts of the cosmology can be represented or can be seen as well in the bronze drums too. So my point is that uh, when we try to link everything together, we can see that the art, artworks has functions <coughs> It's not just for you know, to look at at the museum, but with, when you have to understand the artwork, you have to look at it in the society. You have to put it back into the context, and you, you of course exercise your imagination based on the evidence that you have, link other things together, you know, using interdisciplinary approach. And when you look at the, the anthropological evidence, you can see that the drums was meant to be beaten, to be heard to send the sound, to transcend this sound to the upper world, to the upper realm. It's not just something that you look at as well. It's, it's, it's to listening. And maybe it's something to release the stress and the discomfort that you have in the Iron Age period. And what happened in the Iron Age period? Early urbanization. Quite stressful world in Southeast Asia and anywhere in the world. When you have early urbanization, you have strangers next to you, right? When you have um, you have noises in your neighborhood, you have noises next to your house, 
uh, uh, strangers, you know, in your communities. Before that, you probably, you know, based on the one-on-one -on -one or the face-to-face -face relationship with your neighbors or with your friends in the community, with your relatives. Everyone knows each other. But in the early urbanization, the world changed a lot. And maybe when we have this ap appearance of the bronze drums, it may be related to that, to, to transcend the world, to, to release the discomfort. Something uh, my professor would, uh, Stan O'Connor would call it like, uh, is this something f uh, like the concert hall that we have today? That you go to the concert hall and then it transcends you to, to another world. So that's the power of the sound associated with uh, the artwork and also associated with the societies you know, used in the rituals. Not just something to, to express or to show the status of the, the leaders only. By the way, that's an example from Yunnan, which is more elaborate. They, they have a kind of uh, the flat tympanum type as well, but they can be more elaborate than the ones that we have in Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, in pin Peninsula Thailand, um, we know now that the bronze drums were made not in one place, not just in southern China or northern Vietnam, but in, in Thailand as well, in part of Isan area, which is the northeastern Thailand. Uh, we, we don't have the evidence of the, the bronze drum making in the south yet, but in terms of iconography, I mean, they, they are different from the ones that we have from Vietnam or from uh, other places. So maybe they were made in, in, in other places too, like in Peninsula Thailand as well. And the casting of the drums itself would be a kind of high theater in the past. It's, not, it's nothing normal. It's the things that would amaze people a lot would be like a kind of the things that you can think on and think with. Um, it's very elaborate. It's a power of the artwork that was embedded in not just the forms of the, the, the iconography of it, but the process of making it, that give it power. So, I use the example in Thailand, when we have the casting of the Buddha images. It's a high theater. You can see that lots of people are gathering around in that event, and the actual birth of the drums would be the moment of high theater. When you break the mold out, and you see it, you polish it, that kinds of things. So artworks have, of course, functions and, and then have the power of it and that power would come from the process as well. And the power of the artworks, of course, is not just uh, something passive. It has an agency. Like the ones that we have in Thailand, you can see that the artworks in the, the bronze statues that we have, we have eye-opening ceremony for the Buddha image that we made. And that make it, uh, you know, give agency to, to the artworks. You go to the temple, not just to see the Buddha statues, or to see the god, the Krishna, for example, in Hinduism. But you want it to go there to be seen by the gods as well. That's the power of the god to give the blessing to you. So it, it has an agency in the sense. And I refer this to Alfred Gales who you know, talk about the, the agency of artwork. Uh, it's an object as at agency. Um, you know, it has efficacy with the appearance, you know, by the physical quality of it, by the complex appearance, the decay, sophisticated technology involved in the making of it, and by the it representations as well. Like it represents gods, it represents the king, or it represents uh, uh, the deities, it represents uh, the Buddha or not, or ancestors in that sense. And um, talking about Stan Corner, one of the work about mythology is so important. Uh, and, and he studied Chanti Suku in Eastern Java, dated to around 11th century. So this, uh, this relief show that the smith would have magical power. They were seen, they, they, they were, uh, seen not just a craftsman who worked something for you, for, for, like, for you, your utilitarian use, but 
is a power process, is a power making it. In this picture, you can see Pima holding the crit. The crit is a ceremonial dagger in Javanese and Balinese uh, and Malay cultures. Uh, holding it with bare hands, with Ganesha, Ganesha who can, the, the god in Hinduism, who can transcend both worlds, you know, the gods of the, the underworld as well. So, being the master of the process uh, and uh, being the master of the transformation of materials, the transformation of matters from the crude ores to uh, beautiful crypts like this. The smiths were also seen as a master of spiritual salvation who can transcend the soul of the dead to the upper realm because he can transform this matter, the ores, the metals, so he can transform the soul of the, the dead as well. So it's kind of analogy. And he, ha he has a beautiful magical power in that sense too. So enough with the, <laughs> with the artworks. Now uh, I will talk more about archaeology and artworks altogether with my, uh, more of my work in, in southern Thailand. With that in mind, um, so this is Peninsula Thailand looking from Google Earth. I will talk about this site, Pukot Thong in Koh Samgyal, which is probably the earliest site uh, excavated by scholars from, from the finance department of Thailand and also by uh, the French institution, by Berenice Berlina at Koh Samgyal too. So Pukot Thong, the first site. In terms of geography, this site, Pukot Thong is very complex. I mean, not just one production site. Uh, but they, uh, they are, there are many sites around the ancient, probably in the ancient harbor, protected by the, the island here. And uh, people selected these sites because it's already protected you know, by the islands and, and very uh, suitable to, to, uh, to conduct their operations in terms of you know, uh, the port harbor, the 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 living of the craft people, the living of the of of the the immigrants probably from India as well. So uh, this area were well selected, and we don't see any modification of the area quite a lot in, in now. Probably the future we we can see it more, but the the sites were destroyed uh, heavily by the looting because of the beads. Like this, they are beautiful, and they were pricey. And when something is expensive, the, the, the looters will loot it and then sell it to the black market. And so the site would more or less like destroy it. But my point is that it's very complex, and it has little uh, size around the ancient bay. And in the size, we don't see only the finished products, the finished beads. But we see also the, the debris, the production uh, debris, uh, the process of it, something that's unfinished, uh, raw materials, glass. So these sites were factory, more or less, and it's, it's huge. I mean, it's not just uh, some craft uh, people making things, but we have seen this quite a lot. So it's more like a, a factory size uh, production uh, center in the past. But they were using Indian technology. Bernice Berlina, the French scholar, uh, proved that it's, it's the Indian technology that has been uh, using to make these kinds of beads. Uh, so the question is, why do they have to come here? <laughs> My answer, I mean part of the answer is that perhaps they came here to make these goods and not to sell it back to India. They say it here in Southeast Asia because in South China Sea, the principalities, the communities around here were the huge market for them. That's why the agency is here that draw them here. They just not come here just to, to produce and get the raw materials and then send it back. No, because the requirements for them to venture apart, you know, cross the Bay of Bengal is because of the importance of this area. The importance of the Gulf of Siam, the communities around the Gulf of Siam, and the communities around the South China Seas. Okay, so Kosongke is another site, and the products are the same. Look, be very beautiful, beautifully made. 
with all kinds of beads, glass beads, stone beads, um, can be dated to around the fourth, uh, fifth of, I mean, 400, 500, 400 uh, BCE. So it's, it's one of the earliest uh, sites in, in production size of beads and ornaments in Southeast Asia. And these beads were probably traded to Guangzhou even, South China Sea. We have seen these in the Han tombs in Guangzhou. The same type, the same beads. And probably made in Khao Song Kheo or, or somewhere in the South China Sea and then traded up to Guangzhou. Um, so, some of them were believed to represent uh, the early symbols in Buddhism and Hinduism, but probably Buddhism. We, we have seen some examples from Parahut with the uh, Yakshi wearing these kinds of beads and his three retina, which is the symbols of the three jewels, the, the three gems in, in Buddhism. And some of them were made uh, using the Indo-Roman art. So probably made in India, uh, but you know, it's, it's based on the Roman prototypes. We have seen this in Kolupat and we have seen this in, uh, in Tashana as well in, in southern Thailand. I'll show you the site later. So um, the world were well connected. In, 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 in around the first centuries BCE, I mean the late centuries BCE to the early centuries CE, the items from the Roman world, the items from the, the, the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, can make their way to Southeast Asia and to Okkel too, I mean to Vietnam as well. Uh, when the fire department, the government of Thailand surveyed the site, uh, the survey, the caves in, southeast, uh, in, in southern Thailand, in peninsula Thailand, uh, they have seen these beads around, I mean, in the caves and all that. So it means that, but, but only the finished products in the caves. It means that the communities around in that area were like traded and give it, I mean, um, were the, the con consumers, the customers of these production sites. Why? Why do they need these beautiful things? They're just not conceived properly as beautiful things, but something to show their status too. I mean, in the world without these beads before that, the, the distinction between people, the appearances, were, were not so quite clear. But with these, I mean, this is a, a, the anthropological concept about prestige goods. We, we have a lot of literature about that. But with these goods, uh, the society can, uh, can see more clearly about the status of the people. And then the leaders, I mean the upper class, the elite, can distinguish themselves more and more through the appearance, through the objects, through the artworks, you know, from the rest of the communities. So that's, that's part of the, the, the complex society uh, progression. The Roman items, we have seen it in Okkel, like this one, too. It's a kind of you know, artworks that come and go. So, this again, uh, kind of link it to the, the Gulf uh, neighborhood from southern Thailand to uh, the Mekong Delta to southern Vietnam to Okkel. I will show you the map later on in a bit. But first, before we show you the map, we can see that the Vishnu images as well. This is the earliest Vishnu images. The earliest stone sculptures in Southeast Asia perhaps. I mean Vishnu images from Southeast Asia. This is the earliest style of it. Four of them were found in Peninsula Thailand. That one is the earliest one. And that's a progression. Three of them were from the Kwansi, another province. And that one is, uh, is, is from Suratani. But they are all from the east coast of Peninsula Thailand. And only one from Okkel. And this one were quite derived from uh, the kinds of prototypes from, from the, the, the ones that we have in southern Thailand, in the Kwan Siemrat and Surat Thani. It shows, again, that the trade patterns or the neighborhoods uh, were dictated by the wind patterns. The communities in the eastern coast of Peninsula Thailand here, 
can take the the south uh, west monsoon wind up directly to the Mekong Delta, and then they can trade it up to the head of the Gulf around Central Thailand, and then dial back again. So it's a triangular pattern of trade, and this was confirmed by the ethnographic data from the Malay uh, Malay sailor um, mariner that traded uh, south with fish, you know, uh, dry fish, and then go on and so forth, not long ago. So this was already like the, the, the trade patterns that have the evidence in ethnographic data. And also, uh, um, the evidence that I show you before show that the connection between the eastern coast of the peninsula of peninsula Thailand and Okeo around here were quite clear. And we look at the history of it. We, we know about Funan, which is one of the earliest uh, state or, or uh, like important kingdoms in, in Southeast Asia in the uh, Mekong Delta here around that area. Angkor Burai or Kea were part of that Funan things. And Funan was mentioned like uh, in the 5th to 6th century it was mentioned that I mean from the 3rd century it was mentioned that the king of Funan, Kotinya, came from the Malay Peninsula probably from India and then via Malay Peninsula up to here, to the Mekong Delta. And in the 6th century, probably the Chinese texts mention that Tun Sun, say that has believed that it's probably from there, uh, were part of the Funan. We don't know is it like a, a part of the Funan as vassal or part of the Funan as a partner, but, but it's part of the Funan. Probably it's a kind of network as well. So these things were linked together in the Gulf since the Funan period. And my um, excavation and my, my uh, archaeologi archaeological expedition uh, with the, the thermoluminescence dating confirmed that the evidence of the shrines from, from southern Thailand, some part of, uh, of the size in Nakhon Si Thamarat, can be dated to around the 5th century as well. So contemporaneous with the ones that, that we have from Funan. Person, right? <laughs> Funan, uh, yes, this is a closer map. Uh, Funan, we have Okel. Uh, let's see hit this map. So Okel is here, and that's Angkor Burai around here. I work in Angkor Burai for one summer, so I know that the the site is so extensive, it's huge. It's probably the capital city of Funan, and Okel was another major port of Funan as well. But they were linked by canal system, cut through, very straight. You can distinguish the canals from the rivers immediately by the, the alignment of it. It's not straight, the river had to go like that to, you know, to make it way through in the delta, but the, the, the canals can cut through like that. So it's, a, it's a, a, a communication channel that we don't have it in Peninsula Thailand because we don't dig canals in Peninsula Thailand. We, we don't see that uh, kind of, um, I mean, construction because of the geography are different. The delta is so vast and they have to, uh, you know, it's, it's not very convenient to walk because it's so wet. So digging a canal would be one of the best solution to connect the centers to centers. Like from Angkor here, they can dig a canal to Okel and then from Okel to the Gulf of Siam. They don't go to the west. They don't look to like central Vietnam or a place to open sea on the west, on the east, sorry. But they look to the west to, they, they dig the, can, they dug the canal down to the Gulf of Siam. So everything is channeled through this neighborhood, to, to this area. Access to the Gulf. Uh, back to Peninsula Thailand, you can see the map here. That's the area that I excavated. I mean, part of that. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, I excavated 59 sites, I mean 59 trenches around here, that's the, 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 the dots of the sites that I mapped it. Uh, we can see that the cause of the landscape of this area were the ancient beach ridges. Ancient beach ridges were formed 6,000 years ago. They were formed when we have the, the maximum transgression of seawater coming up and then accumulate the, the, the sand and when it, it, it you know, went down you can still see the, the beach ridge and people settle on that beach ridge since the Iron Age period because it was suitable for communities uh, it's not flooded in the rainy season easily so people in the pre period would settle on that beach ridge there's two of them and people not just long ago 50 years ago would use the beach ridge as the highway, a kind of highway to walk from the north to the south before the road was constructed. Because it's very difficult to walk somewhere else. You have to cross a river, you have to uh, cross the rice fields, you have to cross the forest, wetlands and all that. It's, no, it's not easy. But if you use the, the beach ridge, you can walk easily from north to south. So these beach ridge tied communities together in this area. And the rivers, of course, tied communities from the mountains to the sea, from different eco zones as well. And the mountains were so important for the, the emergence of the kingdom called Tambolinga, which is you know, the kingdom mentioned already in the 2nd or 3rd century uh, CE, and then have uh, lots of evidence from the 5th century to the 13th century. So it's, it's quite a, a, a very big kingdom in, in that time with lots of evidence and my dissertation was fo uh, focused on that. So the mountains was very important because it's the source of the wealth, like the source of uh, the forest products, the, all the kinds of aromatic woods and, and all the goods that the Chinese people and the foreign people came for to this area, came to this area for. Uh, the Chinese came to this area not for rice, not to buy cattle, but they want these aromatic woods and the mountains were the source of that. It's like the bank in your backyard. And this provides a very good opportunity for this area to have a kind of, develop a kind of uh, complex kingdoms to serve that kind of you know, environment. The making of Tamlinka was based on uh, the international trade as well in the 5th, 6th century. So this is the heartland. I grouped them together, you know, the beach ridge and is probably covering around you know, 1,275 square kilometers and all that. It's a heartland that is a pocket here. And I look at one group in particular in this area, cluster 2, because when you look at the map, you see what was going on there. Uh, in the pre late prehistoric period, in the Iron Age period, in around the 5th century, in around 500 BCE, uh, people or communities were usually on the beach ridge. But around the 5th century CE, people started to move to the flat plain, to the lowland, probably for agriculture, for wet rice cultivation. But we have no proof of that, so I look at this site in particular and try to map out the, the area suitable for wet rice uh, cultivation and all the size, all the, the tries uh, that we have, the evidence of that period of time were very close to that kind of wet rice cultivation and when I look at the soil type they all look very suitable for the wet rice cultivation so maybe wet rice cultivation was part of the the, the, the basis for the emergence and for the development of the, the early kingdoms. The early kingdoms have to eat too, you know. You have to look at the agriculture uh, basis. And if you walk there, these are the things that you will see. These kinds of architectural parts made of stone. The shrines were made in two halves, of course. One is the bricks and stones like this, and the upper part were gone because they were made of perishable materials like the pores, the, the wooden poles and the thatch roof and they were gone. So if you walk in the side you see these kinds of things and in Angkorbara you see these kinds of things too. I mean it's kind of uh, uh, the same architectural tradition. Um, so these 
are the things that you, you see uh, the most, we call it the pillar base. So you have the stone pillar base and then you have the wooden pillars on top of it. It will protect the wooden pillars from insects, from, from the wetness, from the, the moisture that would destroy the pillar too. And it will give the, the sturdiness to the, to the architecture, to the shrine. And some architectural parts, of course, uh, were found in the people's backyards, found in the people's house. Uh, like they use it to decorate their backyards with the, the seat and the tables and very comfy. This will be part of someone's backyard too. In the temple you can see that the pillars were used to decorate the temples and the planters in the temples. You know, made of yoni uh, from the past. This is yoni. Uh, you know, yoni to <laughs> the, the base for the shivalinga. Uh, but the temples use it as planter. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's good because they don't destroy it. Some temples destroy it and that's sad. But uh, some temples would keep it and then put it in a part of decoration of their gardens, which is, uh, which is okay. Uh, and we can see clearly as art historian that the artworks change meanings all the time. You know, not just, it, 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 does, it can stay as Yoni forever. It changed uh, and this is the, the the other part of the you know the life of the artwork, the social life of the artworks, and Kauka, which is one very important site in that area in Nakhon Sitomarat that I show you. This is the the map that I worked with uh, the science uh, the, the the scientists to make. Um, it's north to south. The alignment is from north to south, and it's probably around one kilometer uh, long. On the ridge of this small hill, you can see a series of shrines. And this is the biggest one that we have. So of course, we don't have uh, the, the roof anymore because it was made of thatch roof with the wooden post, so it's gone. Uh, we have the bricks look like that. It's very primitive looking with stone uh, architectures inside. Uh, and this, the, this is the yoni the kinds of special yoni that we have only two of them have high base like that very very special uh, and I map we work with the scientists to to map out uh, the whole thing and we can look at this in, in a 3d form in the lab later on is for the future generation as well in the northern part of it in the northernmost part of the the site of the hill we have seen the area with no brick at all only stones and on top of that platform made of stone, we see a huge boulder carved in a form of linga. So this makes it a kind of linga pravata or the mountain linga. We have seen example from Wat Pu in southern Laos. We have seen the, the example in Orgel perhaps. We have seen uh, the example in uh, central Vietnam uh, as well. So this is probably another one of that. But this is probably the only one with the carving because those, those three that I, I mentioned uh, were not carved. I mean, were natural, linga, were, were natural boulders sticking out from the, the mountains. Um, but why is it important, Linga Pravata? It was considered to be the most sacred thing, uh, one of the most sacred things that, that Hinduism can have because the, the god Shiva chose to present himself in the landscape. It's not man-made. It's, it's naturally made, made by the God. He show himself to you. Uh, and this surrounding that is a young forest. Probably, uh, I mean, in the past, this was prominently uh, seen from the sea or from the, the, the mountain as well. Back to this, I forgot to mention that this try face west, which is way unusual. It can face east too, but face east to the sea, but f it face west to the mountain. It, but I, I believe that it face west because of the importance of the, because of the importance of the mountain as part of the uh, kind of natural linga, you know, back, and then as part of the, the source of wealth that, that the kingdoms would have from the aromatic woods. So I'm coming to the last one, it's five minutes, okay, good. Um, these are the cities in Nakhon Sitomarat. Um, and we have two cities together. 
One is Nakhon City in the north and Pravian City in the south. You probably can guess why the cities look like that. Because it was formed, it was settled, it was uh, created on the beach ridge. And the beach ridge is like that, it's long. So the cities cannot expand in the east-west, it, it cannot have perfect uh, square kinds of shape. It has to be long, it has to follow the, the contour of the land. Um, and this is the great stupa here. We believe that the great stupa, you know, for a long time, were constructed, were first constructed in the 13th century uh, using the... <laughs> we talk about the great stupa more. But my excavation, I, I excavated in, in that cities. Uh, this is the well, we excavated two by two trench, a two by two pit. And we are so lucky to have the well right in the middle of our, our, our pit. One of that. And yeah, that's, that's a, the, the complete one. And the things that came out of that is kinds of, you know, the 13th century, Celadon, like that. And, and from another side, we have uh, the Persian Brasla ware from the 9th century too. It's very international. I mean, in terms of trade. And the cities, this is a Pravian city. This is all the size that I excavated with the dots here. And we can see that this, the, the areas around here have the northern Sung ceramic, dated from the 11th century. But the area in the north, in, in the city itself, have late southern Sung ceramic. So it's, it's like people move from south to north when the city was founded probably around uh, the 13th century. And some <coughs> of the, the potteries were very, very interesting, like this one. It's local candy ceramic, we call it five paste ware. And five paste ware were widespread. I mean, they were found in, in uh, the Philippines even. They were found in, in Indonesia, in Kota China, in Sumatra. And uh, we believe that there are two sorts of the, con uh, of the pottery making. One is from Southern Thailand, another one is from Java. But uh, my, I mean, Southern Thailand in, in Kokmo, in, in Sating Pra, Jenny Stargard excavated that site. But my uh, excavation proved that Nakhon Sumat is another site of production too. And it was not replaced by the Chinese ceramics because it keeps the water cool in a hot environment. So the Chinese ceramic cannot keep the water cool in the, in, the, uh, in the climate. So that's why these things survive, I mean, this form of candy survive too, because it's, it's used in the rituals, of course, in the Buddhist and Hindu rituals, and also in the mundane, um, in, uh, mundane context as well. My excavation proved that in the mundane context, like the whales itself have these kinds of uh, uh, ceramics as well. So it's not just used in the ritual context, but it was like using in the, in the, in the um, daily life context too. The crest tupa, we believe in the past that it was made, you know, used, most waste was uh, created based on the, the Langan school of art. But the, now the excavation proved that it was dated, the, the base itself, I mean the bricks from the, from the base, from the foundation of the stupa, can be dated to around the 9th century. So it's what before that. And if you look at it, you can see that the main stupa was surrounded by a kind of a series of smaller stupas. And that's a series of smaller stupa form a kind of mandala. And that reminded us of the Javanese mandala which is very, very unique to the, to the Japanese art as well. Like Robudo, you see the main stupa surrounded by uh, smaller stupas in the forms of mandala, in the forms of the, the, the sacred circles. Sometimes square like Brahmanan, even though it's Hindu context already, but in Java, people still have the main shrine surrounded by a series of la I mean, three layers of of a smaller shrines. So, Panuwap has uh, compared this uh, shape of the stupa, and it, it can be compared to the one that we have in Borobudur, in Java, and then it can be compared as well to, uh, to the Pala art. And that linked us to the Ligor inscription, which uh, say that the the area in Nakhon 
or in the area east of uh, the pen of Peninsula Thailand uh, were part of the part of the network called Sivijaya and is part of the influence I mean the, the, the influence sphere of the Chilendra from Java and, and then later on they moved to to Sumatra too. So it was related to Sivijaya more or less in terms of architecture and that's the first thing that we have um, now. So in terms of art artifacts we can see that is uh, Mahayana Buddhism was part of the cultural history of of uh, Peninsula Thailand and of the Sinai. But anyway, I mean, it's it's not uh, um, it's not just the place that we see now as part of the Theravada Theravada Buddhism uh, world. But in the past, it was part of the Mahayana Buddhist uh, network as well. So conclusion. So Peninsula Thailand was a maritime crossroad, of course, and uh, nowadays Thai, the, the Thai government have a, a very large project called EEC to bring this Gulf of Siam uh, to be the hub again of Southeast Asia and probably of Asia. So the hub became very important once again, and and um, this kinds of story can be, I mean, can can help. Uh, kinds of policy making process too if, if we put it correctly um, so my last slide is about you know we artistry and all the things that we talk today will be related to the future too it has a the modern relevance thank you uh, well thank you very much um, it's, it's really a privilege to be here. I want to thank the center and Ashley and Pamela and our respondents, uh, my fellow speaker. Um, I'm very happy to be able to, to share with you some of the research that we've been conducting uh, at the site of Cold War located in northern Vietnam. And actually, I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned Ian as well. Um, he was very instrumental in helping me to get started with my research in Vietnam, and his loss is felt by many, many of us. Um, but what I'd like to talk about would be some of the ongoing field investigations at this site and how some of our interpretations intersect with contemporary societies, with some of our different agendas in terms of building history, uh, particularly for Vietnam, and building notions of identity as well and cultural heritage. Uh, as Sam mentioned, looking at maps is very important when we start thinking about some of these questions. And so, one of the things that we've noticed, uh, at least in our studies of early civilizations for much of Asia, is that many of the cases that people often talk about when it comes to early centers of urbanism or early state-level societies usually come from parts of South Asia or East Asia. Um, what I'm hoping is that with much of the ongoing archaeological or historical work that's being done in Southeast Asia, we can begin to fill in some of these gaps. Now, one of the things that we've also noticed is that when people do talk about mainland Southeast Asia and these sorts of examples, uh, many of the case studies that come to us date to the common era. Phenomena like Angkor, for example, coming to us as examples. And one question that I would ask is how many people in this room have heard of the site of Gaulois prior to today? Site of Angkor Wat. Uh, not of uh, Angkor Wat, but of Gaulois. Oh, Gaulois. Yeah, in <laughs> Vietnam. Okay, that's good. There are a few hands here. Um, not too many people outside of Vietnam know that much about the site and know that much about its history, and that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about today. To sort of foreground this discussion, uh, one of the things that we might point to would be this sort of intersection between <coughs> contemporary ideas about nations and meta narratives that people create with links to the distant past. Sometimes these links are real. Sometimes they might be um, embellished. But there are these, these sorts of moments, especially for post-war or post-colonial context in parts of Asia. Actually, this is true for any country. We can think of examples. Uh, where the past is connected to present-day uh, politics. One example that we can point to would be from the Korean Peninsula. This is the tomb of an individual known mytholo mythologically to the Korean people. Uh, an individual known as Tangun. And Tangun was the supposed founder of the Korean civilization, the first dynasty, dating to about 5,000 years ago. 
And back in the 1990s, North Korean researchers claimed to have found the tomb of Tanbin, found his remains, and dated the remains to, lo and behold, exactly 5,000 years ago. The ascribed date to when he purportedly exists. They built this very nice monument. This is right outside of the modern day city of Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. Now, some people look at this with a skeptical eye and wonder how accurate some of these claims might be. But regardless of what we might believe, this is a very clear illustration of how the past can be appropriated for politics. Um, we can think of other examples, I'm sure. Uh, the great site of uh, Great Zimbabwe, for instance, the enclosure yielded soapstone carvings of birds that are now prominently displayed on the national flag and currency for Zimbabwe. Uh, Angkor Wat, for example, featured very prominently on various uh, flags of regimes throughout the 20th century. But there is this clear link. And the same can be said about what happens in Vietnam. So we can see on this particular image, this is an image of the Hung Kings, the very first legendary dynasty of early Vietnamese history and civilization that is today displayed on the walls of the Independence Palace in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, this dynasty purportedly goes back some 5,000 years, and it, it rivals some of the dynastic uh, meta-narratives that we see for the northern neighbors in China, or Sinitic civilization, to the north. And for many Vietnamese researchers, whether historians, art historians, or archaeologists, this is a very important time period. And there has been a concerted effort to find uh, the, the, the kinds of material correlates that might be related to some of these stories. Now, if you'll indulge me for just a second, I'd like to share with you some personal information and how I've come to start working on these kinds of topics. <coughs> so as you may have guessed, uh, I'm of mixed ancestry. My father is Korean, hence the Kim, which is like Smith in Korea. Uh, and my mother is Vietnamese. And I was actually born in Saigon back in 1974. Uh, we left uh, actually on April 29th, 1975 the day before Saigon fell uh, by helicopter as refugees from the rooftop, not this rooftop, but something similar to it, the USAID building in downtown Saigon. And we left as refugees before ending up in the United States. I tell this story for a couple of reasons. One, it, it is really a, a, a privilege for me to be able to go back to Vietnam now and to do work there on early history. When we left, and that, that is me with my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. I used to be cute. <laughs> Things have changed. Uh, but my father took these photographs. He was a photojournalist working in Vietnam. So he had a camera bag with him and, and documented this journey uh, from Vietnam through the Pacific before we ended up in Florida in refugee camp. Um, so it is a privilege to be able to work there. But the other reason I bring this up is because, so here's my mother's family. This is from the 1950s. This is the Ningbing province up in the north. There's my mother. I think she's about six or seven years old there. Um, which is the same age as my oldest daughter now, so it's kind of funny to think about how life comes around in a circle. But she tells me that as she was growing up, her, her older siblings all learned about some of the things we're going to be talking about today, some of the legendary accounts. But for them, it wasn't told as mythology. It was not told in terms of legend. It was accepted history. These were in textbooks. It was part of the curricula in school. So everything that we were going to be talking about was taught uh, as history. So this brings to mind, for me, how archaeology and the material record can be a part of this construction process, this project of creating history. And I've got Vietnam in quotes here because, of course, 2,000 years ago, there was no Vietnam. Right? There was nothing like it, at least not in any kind of iteration that we know of today. To further illustrate this connection between politics and the past, we know that Ho Chi Minh uh, talks about this Declaration of Independence from 1945. And he talks about how this was a very important day for all of the descendants of these legendary kings, the Hong kings, the Hongbang, Hongbang dynasty, from way back when, as well as the Lok people, dating from about 2,000 to 2,500 years ago. That everyone living in the present day part of Vietnam, in this area, are descendants. This kind of clear lineage back. He had a very heavy interest in history, and that also lent itself into archaeology. So for uh, many, many 
years, he would visit various sites as these meta-narratives about struggle for independence against foreign sources or domination, foreign cultures and civilizations, especially Sinitic civilization, um, came to the forefront. The Institute of Archaeology was established in 1969, and it was immediately appropriated. It was very closely tied to history. The mission was to find the material correlates for the textual accounts. Everything that we know from the legendary accounts, from the various texts that were recorded about these di dynasties uh, and about some of the key figures and kingdoms that are mentioned in them, were part of the original research missions. And here's the very first inaugural issue. I've got the Vietnamese and the French. I know it's difficult to see, but all the articles are concerned with those kinds of legendary accounts. We know that the way Vietnam looks today was not the case a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, right? This is a national set of boundaries that exists today. Um, Chris Gosha's book talks very uh, specifically about this in a chapter that he called the many different Vietnams that we're looking at millennia of change, cultural change and development. Very, very, very many different uh, ethnic groups, languages and cultures different kinds of kingdoms and states that would have exi existed. So this is a diverse history for this area of the world. And a couple of things that he says I think are important to keep in mind. Um, the traditional view is this Sinicization model, right? And this is the case for much of Southeast Asia, whether it's coming from the West or from the North, um, that we're not talking about passive recipients, right? He says it's important to emphasize the internal trajectories, the internal actors, and their, their various strategies for taking in other kinds of cultures and interacting with other kinds of cultures. And one of the reasons this is important for Vietnam is because of this ascribed date of 111 BCE, where the Han purportedly come in and annex this part of the Red River Valley. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So to geographically orient ourselves, for many people in Vietnam, it's the north that is the crucible for Vietnamese civilization. Everything that we see further is in the central part and to the south, that's added on in, in more recent centuries. But it's really this area here, the Red River Valley and Delta area, what's known as Bakpo. This is the Gulf here, uh, Bakpo or Tonkin. And to us, what's important to, to, to look at as part of the story is the archaeological culture known as Dong Sun, which I'm, I'm sure many of us are familiar with, but also one of the sites that's located in that region. That's the Teng Golwa site that's known to us through a combination of archaeology as well as some of these textual accounts that I mentioned. But these would be very important parts of this project of reconstructing history. Okay, so we have increasingly today uh, various data sets that allow us to ask questions beyond just the creation of meta narratives, but to start asking about why. Why do we see urbanism at this point in time? in this location, what kinds of factors and conditions contributed to this kind of social complexity. So, because I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Dongsun, I'll just briefly highlight some of the attributes. This is a Bronze Age into the Iron Age archaeological culture that's heavily concentrated in the northern part of Vietnam. Uh, over 100 different sites have been found, mostly burial sites. There are some workshops and some settlements that have also been located. But the Dongsun culture is renowned uh, for a few attributes. Uh, we start to see clear signs of status differentiation at around this time. This is reflected in many of the burials. There are different kinds of grave goods that show that the wealth, there is wealth disparity between individuals within various communities. This is a wet rice producing society or set of communities. And they're renowned, as, as Sal mentioned, for bronzes like the specimen here, these very large ceremonial bronze drums, known as Hegar I and other kinds. Um, many specimens have been found all throughout this area. And what's interesting about these specimens and many of the other kinds of bronzes is some of the iconography, the motifs that are displayed, giving us some inklings about daily life and some of the rituals. Um, this particular specimen was found at the site of Koloa back in the early 1980s. Uh, it's about 72 kilograms in weight. People estimate that anywhere from 1,000 to 7,000 kilograms of crude material, raw material, were used in the manufacturing process of just that one specimen. 
So it gives you some idea of the kind of wealth that, and the specialized knowledge that would be associated with this kind of production. We also have motifs that are prominently displayed, these individuals with feathered headdresses. This appears to be a boat with warriors. Um, there's another drum located here. There's an archer with bow and arrow on top. It gives us some ideas. And if we think about the, some of the iconography, going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of uh, national thought, this is very important because the Dongsun culture is the last sort of indigenous culture, if you will, before the Han come into this area. So this is significant when you're thinking about a pre-Sinitic past because the Han would come in at around 111 BCE and the Chinese essentially would stay for about a thousand years in this part of the world. So for many people afterwards, there's a hearkening back to this pre-Han or pre-Sinitic past, not unlike what we see with other cases around the world. If we look at the tympanum, for instance, and we see some of these motifs, uh, they were similar to the ones that Sam showed earlier. You have the star shape here, you have the cranes on the out outer band here. If you go, I don't know how many of you have been to Vietnam or to the city of Tang Hoa, for instance, but I was just there last year and saw this on the street. I didn't know it existed, but you can see the crane motif in the monumental kind of construction, the drum sitting right in the middle. This is prominently displayed right in the middle of the city as you enter the city in the Tang Hoa province. These kinds of motifs are prominently displayed not just in architecture, they're on postcards, they're on, I was sitting in the office and I noticed the tea with the similar kinds of motifs right on them. Okay, so it's a, it's a very important part of Vietnamese identity. So, let's talk about the Goloa site. This is to geographically orient ourselves. The site is located right outside of the present day city of Hanoi, uh, about 17 kilometers to the northeast, just across the Red River. And here's a satellite image showing us the Red River Coming through, we have modern-day Hanoi. This is the Tangong Citadel, the capital of Vietnam from about the 11th century onwards after uh, the, the, the independence from Semitic civilization. And this is a game I like to play with my students. Can you spot the archaeological site? <laughs> Some of you may be looking northward. And there it is, sitting right there. I like this image because it, it gives us a sense of how important this particular piece of geography is for Vietnam and for the idea of Vietnam. We have this particular site that is supposedly a capital, and we'll talk about that. We have the Tangong site, and then we have the modern day capital, Hanoi, all associated with this area, with that river. I'm sure you recognize this image. We are sitting right here. Right now, okay. And at roughly the same scale, the same altitude, this is the Kolwa site. You can see where it's located. This is the uh, Dongang district, the Kolwa commune. Parts of the site are heavily uh, occupied today, so it kind of limits the access that we have to explore and investigate. But there's a lot of farmland as well. And what you might notice are some of the enclosures, and we'll talk about that too. Um, but the site, is massive. It's about six square kilometers, 600 hectares in area. Um, 450 which is enclosed by the outermost wall. This is roughly about 1,100 football fields. And when I say football, I mean American football field sizes. Um, but it makes it one of the largest, uh, actually the largest for the Dong Sun culture. All contemporaneous sites in northern Vietnam, this is the largest by far. And it also makes it one of the largest that we know of for Southeast Asia for that pre late prehistoric time period. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the pier sites and other kinds of moat sites a little bit later, but for, for that purpose, it is one of the largest examples of this kind of settlement. Here we can see, and I want to point out some of the enclosures. This is the innermost wall. It's about 1.65 kilometers in its perimeter. It's punctuated by a series of bastions, roughly rectilinear in shape. The middle wall, uh, it's irregular in shape, and this is about 6.5 kilometers around, and then the outermost wall, 8 kilometers around. 
Now, these walls still stand today. They're earthen ramparts, and they still stand in various states of disrepair, um, up to 10 meters in height in certain places, 25 to 30 meters <coughs> wide at the base. And people estimate that anywhere from a million to two million cubic meters of earthen materials were used in the construction process of these ramparts. Uh, they're associated with outer moats and ditches. And according to legend, they may have had uh, watchtowers and other kinds of features associated with them. There has been a lot of debate about when this site actually comes into existence and how, what kinds of factors may have been involved and who may have been responsible. Uh, these debates have relied traditionally upon some sources of textual information, which we'll talk about. And increasingly, we're using archaeology to enter into that conversation. But the big question for a lot of people is by whom? Who is responsible for this site? The answer is not King Arthur. Uh, but I have this up here. This is one of my favorite depictions, actually, of King Arthur. That's from, I'm sure you know, Monty Python and the whole thing. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because a, a lot of the Arthurian tales, to me, are sort of analogous to what we see with the stories about the Gold Lost site. So whereas we have Camelot for King Arthur, uh, legend says that we have a king, we have the Gold Lost site, instead of the Lady of the Lake handing Excalibur to King Arthur. Um, in the Vietnamese traditions, there is no relationship, by the way. I'm not claiming any kind of relationship. <laughs> But for the Vietnamese, there was a turtle that came out of the, the, the water that gave the king, a man by the name of An Zeng Vung, uh, advice about how to build his defenses, to build this city, to his, his seat of power, and also offered one of its claws to him to be used as a trigger mechanism for his crossbow. And this was a magical crossbow that allowed him to vanquish entire armies with single shots. So we have this one source of traditional information that, come to us, that comes to us from various Vietnamese traditions. Oral traditions that were passed on through the, throughout the generations, recorded many centuries later uh, in accounts from the medieval period, for instance, in the 15th century. But they describe what happens at that point in time. According to these legends, this individual by the name of An Zeng Vuong, also known as Tuk Phan, comes to power in 3rd century BCE by overthrowing the last of the Hung kings. That initial image that I showed you was the Hung King Dynasty. He overthrows the last of them. He has advice from the magic turtle. He has this powerful technology in the crossbow. And he founds Skola as his capital and seat of power. And as I mentioned earlier, this is accepted as history in Vietnam. Now one of the things that we might point out would be some of the issues that might be associated with these textual traditions. Um, Liam Kelly in Hawaii has pointed out some of the, the potential issues, uh, one of which might be that we are mixing historical details with the supernatural, with appeals to magic. Um, these textual accounts were not formally recorded until well after the fact, well after the point in time in which they purport to describe. So, whereas these events supposedly happened in the third century <coughs> BCE, these textual accounts are recorded uh, well after, many, many centuries after, and maybe, just maybe, because of the time period in which they were recorded, there might be some element of projection, right? wishful or aspirational thinking, how we would like our past to look, and perhaps there is some element of that kind of bias that's uh, projected into that past. The other source of information that people have traditionally used would be Sinitic texts. So we know that the Han come into this area, 111 BCE, uh, various Sinitic chroniclers during the Han period and later periods would write and record information about the kinds of people that they encountered. There's very little direct reference to the Goldwa site itself, but they do talk about the southernmost barbarians within the realm and how these folks were in need of civilizing effectively. It was the Han that would have to bring in sophisticated forms of governance, metalworking, uh, and farming. This area is really just a repository for useful resources, exotic resources, that would be brought back up to the north. Uh, of course, we have to take these accounts with a grain of salt as well and, and be critical about the kind of bias that may be associated with them. Uh, it's not uncommon for these kinds of colonial powers to, to look uh, in derogatory ways at some of these other communities that they annex. And I'm centralizing here. This is a very... Uh, 
a centralized straw man argument about two various viewpoints. Right? On the one hand, we have civilization that may have come about as a result of local trajectories of cultural change, indigenous explanations, if you will. But on the other hand, we have this other explanation, the synesthetization model, where a civilization is an outcome that's imposed by a foreign power. Uh, what I'm proposing today is that really it's a combination of the two, and we'll see some evidence for that. But the point is that this kind of material record is very important when we evaluate these sorts of debates and claims. Now back in uh, the 1970s, Steve O'Hare published a paper in Asian Perspectives describing some of these textual accounts and what the the Han encounter when they come into this part of the world. And there are a couple of things that I, he talked about back in 1979 that I think are very appropriate. He calls for greater collaboration between historians and art historians and archaeologists in various disciplinary backgrounds. And he also very specifically says that we need more reliable information. Okay. Uh, one particular quote, sometimes an old poem can tell you where to dig. So giving us an idea that these literary accounts might be a very good source to start with. Right, to give you ideas about what kinds of sites to look at, what kinds of information need to be gathered. And of course, dating. Dating of the site can help to resolve many of these ongoing debates. And he specifically references Skolwa. So using that as a sort of basis, uh, my colleagues in Vietnam and I have been looking at the ramparts. I mentioned that much of the site is heavily uh, inhabited today, so it limits the kinds of places we can go to to access information. So we looked at the ramparts, which are still there today, as maybe a, a very suitable proxy measure for when the city may have emerged. So if you see those kinds of monumental constructions, and if you can reliably date them, that might give you some idea about the rest of the society. We embarked on three investigations starting in 2007, uh, looking at various parts of the ramparts. And these were the very first systematic investigations that were undertaken for the ramparts. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we could identify various phases of construction, different chronological time periods. These would be based on relative dates, looking at artifacts, as well as thermoluminescence of some of the ceramics, but also from organic materials, radiocarbon dates, stratified in various layers of construction. The period of interest for us today would be this middle period. This is an excavation profile through the first uh, investigation. This is the middle wall. This is in 2007. Um, I, I don't have time to talk about too much uh, what was found at the very bottom, but we have architectural features and pottery associated with the Dongsun culture with radiocarbon dates from about 500 to 300 calibrated BCE. These features appear to have no structural relationship to the larger rampart that would follow. In other words, if you knew we were going to build that larger rampart, there'd be no reason to build these smaller features right there. In any case, the period that we are interested in would be these three, uh, as well as the materials that were found at the top of that last layer, this phase four. These are roof tiles that were found. But phase three, we have evidence for rammed or stamped earth, and that's going to be significant, as we'll talk about a little bit later. But the materials on uh, the totality of data show us that we're looking at construction within this time period. We don't know exactly when it's difficult to, to piece that together, but the dates tell us that it, it happens within this window between 300 and 100 calibrated BCE. Now, the roof tiles, they were found starting at about one meter below the, the current surface of the rampart. The roof tiles are ubiquitous at this site. If you go anywhere where the road's been cut through or where part of the wall is collapsing, in the same stratigraphic layer, you find the roof tiles, fragments. In just this excavation alone, thousands of fragments were found, more on the interior side. Some of it may have slipped in the exterior side into the moat or the ditch that we also looked at. Um, and the interesting thing about the roof tiles is at this point in time in Vietnam or in anywhere in northern Vietnam, no roof tiles at any other site only at this particular site. We have Dongsan pottery, as I mentioned at the bottom, and as I mentioned earlier, Dongsan culture materials are found all over northern Vietnam. But the roof tiles are restricted just to this one location. 
we're still trying to figure out what the tiles are doing here. And if anybody has any ideas, I'd love to talk about it. Um, there are various hypotheses. Some say that maybe there was a roof-like structure on top of the rampart. This is uh, after the debris has fallen down. Perhaps this is garbage. These are roof tiles that were taken from buildings uh, elsewhere in the site. That they were put here intentionally to help shore up against erosion and rain, the monsoonal rains. Um, in any case, we're still trying to figure out exactly why. But the materials found with the tiles give us an idea that perhaps they date to about the late second century BCE. Okay. We also looked at the outer wall. I will just briefly highlight the construction sequences, relatively consistent with what we saw with the middle wall. Um, no evidence of the Dongsan materials at the bottom. We didn't see that here. We also did not see uh, the layers of stamped earth that we also saw in the middle wall. But the construction phases do appear to be consistent chronologically with what we saw in the original excavation. And beyond that, it also appears that there were amplification phases. Efforts to refurbish and build and augment the size of the rampart later on. And we suspect that this would be in more recent centuries. The innermost wall has been a source of a lot of contention because it doesn't look like the other two walls. The other two walls are very irregular in shape. This is rectilinear, and for a lot of people, it could be late, and it could be related to Chinese civilization. We know that ancient China, uh, many of the early settlements in urbanized areas and cities would often use these kinds of straight lines in the morphology of the cities. And so a lot of people have theorized that perhaps this is a late construction, after the Han come in or sometime after. So we excavated a portion of the rampart as well as one of the bastions associated with it. And interestingly enough, the materials appear to be consistent. The same roof tile fragments also uncovered here. The chronology coming from radiocarbon dates also give us a very similar window, 300 to 100 calibrated BCE, giving us the idea that perhaps this is contemporaneous, that maybe we're looking at a system of enclosures put up around the same time Okay, we don't know exactly when, and we don't know if there is a sequence involved, but we know that it's within the same window. We also, again, see later historic uses of the site. This is a kiln dating to just a couple centuries ago right, that was placed uh, in, in this rampart. All this was hidden because we had no idea this was here, uh, but only discovered it probably dates to either the Lei or the Nguyen periods of uh, Vietnamese history. So as I mentioned, the roof tiles are absent anywhere else in Vietnam for that time period. We don't see roof tiles in Vietnam until maybe two or three centuries later, outside of this site. But when we look at the roof tiles, and we look in concert with some of these other materials, excavations that the Vietnamese have done in some of the middle areas, the innermost areas, have uncovered casting areas, as well as casting molds. These are molds used for crossbow bolts, the tips bronze crossbow bolts, these points. Uh, they found trigger mechanisms made of bronze that probably are associated with crossbow mechanisms, as well as farming implements. Uh, thousands of crossbow bolts have been found in one particular area in a cache. I mentioned the bronze drum. And then we have these roof tile fragments that have been found as well. Um, again, in totality, we're looking at this middle period. right? And when we consider that, that middle period for these various artifacts and these collections. Um, one of the things that, that I would point out would be, if you think about the monumental size, the scale, right? this is roughly 25 meters across. This middle wall, again, six and a half kilometers around. Think about the kinds of resources that would have to be marshaled to put all this together. If these walls are contemporaneous, if they're constructed by the same society, uh, the amount of labor that would be necessary, all the resources to feed the laborers. The idea of even doing this right, and planning it from start to finish would be very important, this kind of monumentality and the control that would be necessary. Uh, it brings to mind for me some of the ideas uh, proposed by Anderson and others about this imagined community. If you are participating in this construction process, whether you live at this site or right outside of it, what kind of message is that imparting to you as a participant, as a community member? But what does it also say to those living on the outside and viewing it? 
if you're building uh, a system like this, you're probably expecting that it's going to be for quite some time, be in use for quite some time. Right? If we think about the upkeep and maintenance that would be required, not just to build the system, but then to continue using it. So this kind of multi-generational authority that may have existed, for me, speaks to something that would be akin to an early state. A very loosely defined definition, of course. But if we think about durable institutions of authority of, st of ancient states, okay, I see no reason to preclude this particular case study from our discussions about early civilizations, early states, or early forms of urbanism in Southeast <coughs> Asia. So maybe one of the earliest that we can point to in late prehistory. As I mentioned, we don't have a lot of settlement data. It's difficult for us to reconstruct demographic information and populations. But we do have other sources. The Han took census accounts around uh, the first uh, century. And they estimated that for this particular part of the empire, uh, we're looking at close to a million individuals. This would be the most densely populated south of the Yangtze River area. Now, of course, there may be some element of, of, of exaggeration or bias for taxation purposes. Uh, but it does speak to how populated this region could have been. And even though we're looking at a few centuries later, when we think about the agricultural potential, right, this is one of the most productive areas in, in mainland Southeast Asia today. And if we think about how many people could have been supported in this time period, uh, that in combination with the archaeological evidence for agricultural intensification, bronze plowshares, other kinds of tools, um, we are probably looking at a fairly high level of, of population for this time period. I conducted some architectural energetic calculations. I won't bore you with the details, but essentially I looked at rates of, of construction in comparable areas around the world using similar kinds of materials and tools. And I came up with some estimates. If we use a very conservative starting point of 1 million cubic meters, and remember, some have estimated that maybe 2 million cubic meters were used in construction. But if we just do 1 million, uh, we're looking at a lot of labor. And the estimates could be anywhere from a few years to uh, a couple of generations for the entire site to be built by anywhere from 1,000 to several thousand people. <coughs> Uh, the upshot is that we're looking at a lot of control, again. So what does this all mean if we're thinking about that first question right, of early Vietnam? Does An Zung Vung actually exist? Was there some kind of Olak kingdom that existed associated with the Cold War site? If you ask my collaborators, the answer is unequivocally yes. We have the dates, we have the evidence, we know about these connections. This is, without question, the capital of the Ola Kingdom. Uh, I'm not as comfortable going that far out on the limb. I think there is some support for some of these textual descriptions. We can see evidence of some of those items, like the trigger, like the crossbow bolt, for instance, uh, all the centralized production facilities and the evidence for them. Um, but until I see a tomb, or some kind of writing that specifically refers to this individual, I think it's very difficult to say with any kind of certainty. Uh, for me, I'm much more comfortable talking about something complex. There is no question that we're dealing with a complex society, one that I would characterize as a state, but I would prefer to leave it ambiguous. Right? This is, the, for me, the Golal polity. It dates to this time period, but for those that might know something about the history in this region, it could refer to any number of different possible kingdoms that people have talked about in historical texts. But what is clear is that this appears to be something that predates the Han intrusion into this part of the world. So we can't look at that kind of model as an explanation. So going back to that original dichotomy, foreign imposition, indigenous development, uh, I think it's a spurious one to really bring up. There's no question that this Sinicization model, the Sinocentric view, is really not accurate. It's untenable. Right? We can see all these materials here, a very complex society that existed prior to the annexation period. But at the same time, the archaeology tells us that all this does not happen in a vacuum. We can see linkages that are very important all throughout this region. And for the remaining time, I'd like to talk a little bit about, about some of these relationships and how we can tell. Um, 
this particular point in time, as you know, was the tail end of the Warring States period in ancient Chinese history. There is probably a lot of turmoil that's pushing people throughout these regions. And it's quite possible that it's having an effect even this far to the south, over the mountains. But we can point to relationships that might be very close and direct, but also further to the north, these indirect relationships. The relationships are not restricted to the north. We can see in the first millennium BCE, uh, through work by Elizabeth Moore and others, uh, hundreds of Iron Age moated settlements all throughout mainland Southeast Asia. Okay. Um, there are various kinds of cultural uh, traditions associated with them. We don't really know all the functions for these moated sites. They're very uh, different. But what we can say is that there are many examples of them. And if we think about the sizes, right, uh, most tend to be much smaller than what we see with the Gold Lost site. It is by far the largest. So something anomalous is happening in this part of the world, something very different. And I think a lot of that has to do with its proximity to Sinitic civilization. So again, here it is next to the river. And if we consider the river as a, a thoroughfare of connectivity, linking communities up and down from its source point in the Yunnan Plateau, some 1,200 kilometers down into the Gulf, the various communities that would have been con in contact along the river, along the coast, for example, this would have been a very important area in terms of interaction, that sort of hub that, similar to other sites like Casa Mkeo. And in fact, some of the earliest uh, research on silk routes, for instance, tell us that there are certain nodes that are connected to the early versions of the Southwest Silk Roads. And this area would have been one of those nodes. So you mentioned some, some of the bronze ceremonial drums that have been found. Uh, we know that they were found in highest concentrations in this area and in that area at the source point of the Red River. And they're very similar morphologically. And they share iconography. And we also know, as you pointed out, that they have been found, these kinds of materials have been found all throughout Southeast Asia. So if we consider that particular link, what I would also point out is that just to the north, in parts of modern-day Guangxi, we have iconography on rock art, for instance. We have artifacts found in both areas that share similarities in terms of iconography, the feathered headdresses that we talked about earlier. In some cases, even the star-shaped motif appearing on rock art to the north in the mountains. This says something, I think, about the connections between communities in these regions. That maybe for, for the people living in the Red River, the near north was very important. So these links to either the Yunnan or to the Lingnan area in southern China. Now beyond the bronzes, we can see other kinds of materials that connect what we might call a cultural continuum. There are various kinds of societies all in contact with one another. Right? Some people have talked about uh, the, the Yuan or other kinds of communities that are seen here, but there are links between these regions that even points further south and to the west as well. The stamped earth, some of you may have already guessed this, but we see stamped earth in that middle wall construction. And there are earlier examples of stamped earth. And they are from the north. So here we have images of stamped earth used, used as walls, but also used as foundations for buildings from parts of China. <coughs> this is the Longshan culture. This is a late Neolithic site. We have Shang Dynasty walls and foundations also using stamped earth. So when we see the stamped earth, it is reminiscent of these kinds of constructions giving us this possibility that there are indirect links to the central plains, closer to the Yellow River Valley. Now, what's actually different, this may be boring for some of us, but for me, I think this is fascinating. The kinds of stamped earth walls that we see closer to the central plains tend to be straight on their edges. When we move further to the south, closer to the Yangtze River Valley, and points further south, there appears to be a pronounced taper on the exterior of the walls. This has to do, I think, with the kinds of soils that are being used. More lusts up in the north in the Yellow River area. And as you move further south, less of that material, different kinds of soil. This might give us an idea of why we see that kind of construction. The Golas site is also tapered, right? The exterior parts of the ramparts. There may be some kind of link 
to areas of southern and central China, further south away from uh, the central plains, areas of Chengdu, for instance, various kinds of sites, warring state sites, cities that use rammed earth, there may be something that's very similar happening in northern Vietnam. Again, I'm talking about these kinds of connections that may have been occurring during the Warring States period. The roof tiles, some of you I'm sure know, roof tiles have a long history uh, in different parts of China. We have the, the Gola polity roof tiles, but we also know of examples from Sinitic civilization, whether it's the Han Empire or other areas in the Nanyue Kingdom in the southeast of China. They are morphologically very similar. But one of the things that I would point out is there is writing on many of the Sinitic examples. These are usually in royal or elite constructions or palaces. But they often have stylized writing on them. The Golwa examples have no writing, at least none that we have seen. But there is something that I think is interesting. The star shape that's seen on the Golwa examples are reminiscent of to some of the star shapes that we see on some of the ceremonial bronzes. And to my knowledge, and I would be happy to know if anyone knows more about this, but I don't think that this, that similar kind of motif has been seen in Sinitic examples. Right? It's very local to areas further to the south. So this complicates our ideas about these relationships from North Vietnam to points further to the north, whether direct or indirectly. And what I would argue is that what we're looking at here would be these forms of elements seeping their way into this part of the world. We don't know what kinds of mechanisms specifically, but we can see the similarities, the cultural affinities. But perhaps we're looking at appropriations that are buffered, filtered. They're coming in through other sources and not directly. And perhaps we're also looking at efforts by local elites in the Red River Delta to emulate Okay, and what I mean by that is if you look at these materials, like the roof tiles, for instance, as restricted to elite buildings or royal compounds, for instance, they are seen maybe as exotic forms of authority, of political authority. And perhaps those living here, the elites living in the Red River Delta area, may have been thinking about this as a form of leadership strategy. How do we show that we have this kind of power as well? How do we use the similar kinds of materials? And if that knowledge of producing those materials also comes in. Right? Perhaps we're looking at localization of these materials that might account for some of the motifs like the star on the roof tiles that we see just at this particular site. So when we consider this longer project, this history of Vietnam, the making of it, uh, it, it should be clear that we're looking at many different kinds of interpretations, various kinds of actors that are important in this story and that this is a very complex process. And the materials that we can see from Goldwa sit very interestingly in this kind of gap between the prehistoric leading into the historic phase. <coughs> Whether or not An Zhong Vung actually existed, I think, is beside the point. What's important also to consider is how the past is used. Uh, we can see festivals occurring today at the site of Goldwa commemorating An Zhong Vung, commemorating that legendary king whether or not he was real. But there is a power to that material. Right? If we think about landscapes, artifacts, sites, all of these parts of the past that get appropriated and used by various people. Um, history tells us that once the Chinese leave the picture, the 10th century, the very first dynasty, Vietnamese dynasty that comes to power with an individual by the name of Mo Quyn, goes directly to Goldwa to set up his capital. And for some people, the reason is because it's a symbol. The site is a symbol of this pre-Chinese or pre-Sinitic past. And so it's calculated. So it tells us that there are very real links that echo across time. And the refurbishments that we see at Goldwa as well, into the common era, into the second millennium, also tell us that people come back and continually occupy and reuse the site and refurbish and upkeep it. I'll end with just a couple of slides showing what we're doing today. Um, as I mentioned, we don't have access to the entire site for excavation, so uh, we don't have a lot of resources all the time either. So we've been turning to remote sensing for some of our future, uh, current and future work. Um, we did magnetometry at various locations and identified sites that we might excavate. This one particular location 
uh, we were able to identify some anomalies in the ground that we ground truthed or excavated. And they yielded burials uh, just from a couple hundred years ago. So again, giving us an idea of these pers the persistent links through time of contemporary societies or recent societies to that past. But it also gives us an idea of proof of concept. These kinds of methods have never been tried at this site by the Vietnamese. And we're hoping that this kind of analysis will help us in the future. Um, we were also very fortunate in obtaining LIDAR data very recently. And we are just starting to look at the analyses. Uh, so I don't have that much to talk about. But one of the interesting things that I'll, I will point out is if you look right here, this is the inner wall, right, that rectangle with its bastions. There is an elevated area in the southwest corner. Those casting materials that I talked about, the furnaces, all of the centralized control or crossbow bolts, all happens in this area. And it appears to be elevated. And one of the things that we've noticed is that it may actually have its own wall with its own series of bastions. Now, I didn't say this, but earlier, uh, I could have. The legends not only talk about the legend of Anzen Wim, but it talks about nine walls being associated with this site. We can only see three very clearly. But with some of the analyses that we're doing with the LIDAR, it's possible that we might identify other areas that might approximate other enclosures. So those are the kinds of questions that we might answer. Um, and for the Vietnamese today, uh, as you can imagine, this is significant for many stakeholders and for many reasons. There is an element of looking to the past in order to think about the present and to think about the future as well. This is an image from the conservation agency about what they envision for the site of Goa moving forward. How the materials, how the various features might be preserved, the cultural heritage and identity of the site. Uh, how it might be related to tourism in the future, bringing in people from all over the world, not just Vietnam, but all over the world. But it tells us about the significance of the site for national meta-narratives and history, um, and also for research. And we had had a lot of interest from international researchers, but also political figures in Vietnam. Um, the former president of Vietnam, Chen Duc Lung, would visit our excavations to find out what we were finding because I think he was interested to know if we were going to be finding materials that corroborated the legendary mm -hmm. accounts or contradicted the accounts. Um, but in any case, the research I think is significant for their ongoing efforts to promote the heritage and maybe even obtain UNESCO World Heritage Site status for the site. Um, but again, it illustrates the various kinds of agendas that are important for stakeholders, uh, whether in, the, in research or outside of it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. along with our speakers. Um, we're going to start with Ben Rayford. Um, I introduced him earlier. I'll just remind you that he's, uh, he's on the verge of completing his dissertation on the question of seeing the foreigner in early Southeast Asian art. And I'm sorry, Ben will speak second, and Pipat is speaking first. Is that, yes, what is it agree? Okay, yes. So um, Pipat is, uh, is in the first year of, of his doctoral work. Uh, on questions of meta narratives, uh, nationalism, and art historiography, focusing in on the Yitong period um, and the questions of seeking the origins of the Thai state uh, through interpretation of archaeological and art historical data. So, uh, Pipat is going to respond first, and then we'll move on to Ben, and then we'll finish with uh, with Pamela and Corey, um, after which we'll give uh, time to our um, speakers to respond. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank, uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Wan uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Nam Kim uh, for such a uh, fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, Professor uh, Ashley and Pamela uh, for organizing uh, this uh, event. Uh, it is a great honor to uh, have been uh, invited uh, to uh, respond. And I will uh, now offer uh, what uh, comments or something uh, that I can. Uh, I will uh, start uh, by uh, responding uh, to Wana San's uh, work and then uh, Nam Kim's uh, work. So, uh, uh, as I as I understand uh, from uh, those uh, two uh, articles that I, I, I got. 
So uh, I, uh, um, sorry, uh, the East, uh, East Mian uh, tract and uh, the Gulf of uh, Siang, uh, which is an uh, article uh, that uh, one side uh, uh, wrote, uh, is a broad uh, uh, rather than uh, a full paper. Uh, therefore, its uh, purpose is to uh, introduce uh, all the content uh, appearing uh, in this book. Uh, but uh, this prologue uh, is excellent uh, because uh, it gives uh, us uh, much new archaeological uh, information, uh, such as uh, the dating of uh, the great stupa of Pata Nakhon Si Kumrat and new hypothesis, uh, which uh, challenge uh, many uh, old or existing uh, assumptions. Uh, in my view, uh, there are two uh, important uh, arguments uh, in his uh, chapter or his article. Uh, first is that uh, the existing uh, explanations uh, of the formation of uh, sizable uh, kingdoms uh, on the East, uh, East Mian uh, tract uh, were mainly uh, determined uh, by uh, topography uh, factor. Uh, for example, uh, the explanations uh, that Rikbo uh, or uh, Nakhonsi Tomara uh, city uh, was located uh, on the uh, eastern coast uh, because uh, this, uh, this area uh, has a, a vast uh, uh, plain uh, suitable for uh, supporting uh, a large population and uh, good for uh, rice cultivation. Uh, in contrast, uh, Wanasan uh, insightfully uh, proposed uh, that uh, social factors uh, should be uh, considered uh, as the main uh, factors in uh, creating a, a, a sizable uh, kingdoms. Uh, on the eastern coast uh, of the uh, Thai uh, Peninsula or Mali uh, Peninsula. Uh, for example, uh, at this uh, from uh, the 5th uh, century, uh, the Gao of Siam uh, became uh, uh, a, a hub uh, for a uh, trade, uh, which uh, grew uh, uh, in a significant uh, population and socio-political uh, attention. Uh, later on, uh, four uh, kingdoms uh, namely, uh, Chaya, Liko, or Nakhon, Si, Tamara, uh, uh, Sting Park, and uh, Patani, uh, thus uh, dominated uh, at the, the east coast. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I quite agree uh, with uh, his hypothesis, and uh, it is difficult to determine uh, what uh, factors are, are more important. Uh, however, I think uh, the size of uh, all the kingdoms uh, located between uh, the eastern and western coast are uh, uh, different uh, because of uh, the roles of uh, cities, uh, such as a uh, city or a city uh, based on uh, hybrid economies. Uh, the second uh, concern uh, the contradiction uh, between the reliability, reliability of uh, chronicles and the uh, archaeological evidence, uh, in other words, uh, it shows a conflict uh, between the historical analysis based on uh, myths or uh, chronicles uh, and uh, that's uh, based on uh, empirical uh, data. I would like to uh, briefly uh, describe the uh, narrative of Takonsi uh, Tamara's uh, history uh, to show uh, the uh, importance of uh, Wang San's uh, article. Uh, following uh, the Sri Lanka uh, Buddhist uh, tradition of uh, historical writing, the stories uh, in the Tamnan Prata Nguyen Nakhon Chronicle uh, try to link uh, contemporary uh, history to the early uh, Buddhist uh, history. Uh, in, uh, in the opinions uh, of uh, general historians, uh, especially in Thailand, uh, history before uh, the 13th uh, century uh, can hardly be uh, trusted because the story is a liar le legend or something like that. Uh, while uh, history uh, after the 13th uh, century or the third uh, building of uh, Nakhon Si uh, Tamarat city is more uh, reliable. However, uh, according to uh, his work, uh, there is a lot of uh, archaeological uh, evidence and, uh, and uh, recent uh, scientific uh, data showing uh, that uh, the great stupa of uh, Nakhon was built uh, before the 13th century. Uh, it was probably uh, built uh, around uh, 10th century or more than that, I'm not sure. Uh, additionally, uh, this uh, temple was significantly uh, related uh, to the northern uh, community as it shown at Tassarabad. Sure. Uh, 
uh, connected uh, by uh, the ancient uh, uh, sand sandbar or uh, beach bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequently, uh, this interpretation uh, leads uh, us to think uh, more about uh, the role of uh, ancient communities uh, in the uh, Tampon Linka uh, Kingdom uh, in the Sivishaya period. Uh, moreover, uh, we might uh, have to uh, consider the relationship between uh, the Great Dufa of uh, Nakhon and Bulobuto, uh, which was uh, based on a Mandara uh, concept. This means uh, that uh, when we uh, study the forms and uh, plans uh, of Stupa uh, in the south, uh, we have to uh, think uh, about uh, internal development as well as Sri Lanka uh, influence. Um, however, uh, uh, what I wonder uh, when uh, I'm reading uh, this article, why a uh, sizable uh, kingdoms uh, change uh, their religion uh, from uh, Hinduism to Mahayana Buddhism, uh, uh, Buddhism and uh, uh, to uh, Theravada Buddhism, uh, as well as uh, what the role of uh, Islam was uh, in this area. Uh, which was a popular uh, history uh, in, in uh, Patani or Patani. Uh, besides, uh, Wanasa uh, seems to uh, emphasize uh, the roles of uh, Sivichaya, uh, 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 Jawa, and uh, Sri Lanka. But uh, Jama uh, has been uh, found along the eastern coast uh, as well as uh, Chaya. Uh, however, uh, these uh, two issues uh, might be uh, outside his scope. Uh, as uh, his uh, book uh, focuses on uh, the history of uh, Nakhon Si Tamara uh, as well. Uh, moving on to uh, Nam Kim's uh, work. Uh, although uh, Nam Kim's uh, work is based on the north uh, of uh, Vietnam, while uh, Wana San's uh, work is based on the southern uh, Thailand. Uh, and they uh, examine uh, history from uh, different approaches. Both of them uh, make uh, two similar points. Uh, the first is uh, in terms of uh, uh, the study of uh, the real past. Uh, Dongsong uh, culture represented uh, maritime uh, trade and early civilization in Southeast Asia uh, prior to uh, the influence uh, of uh, India and uh, China. The second uh, concerns uh, the reliability of uh, chronicles or the political uh, agenda of modern uh, historiography regarding uh, Dongsong culture. Uh, Nam Kim's uh, uh, examination uh, of the uh, Go Lao uh, site uh, involves uh, uh, two approaches uh, postural and post postural archaeology. Uh, thus, uh, a post postural or uh, postmodern uh, perspective uh, is applied to uh, critic uh, the historiography of uh, Dong Song culture uh, in order to uh, deconstruct. Uh, the discord and perception of uh, Golau's uh, past. Uh, this shows uh, that uh, the grand narrative uh, of uh, this uh, early uh, Vietnamese uh, civilization uh, begins uh, in the Red uh, River uh, Delta, a narrative uh, created uh, based on the synthetic uh, uh, text, uh, which were uh, written uh, after uh, this area was annexed. Uh, by uh, the Han and interpreted uh, following uh, colonialist uh, will. Uh, we can say that uh, this uh, process uh, led to uh, the creation of a dichotomy uh, between uh, civilization and barbarians. Undoubtedly, uh, uh, Dong Song, uh, which uh, represents uh, indigenous uh, people, was categorized uh, as barbarian uh, in the Chinese black cause. Uh, in other words, uh, this also uh, signify, signifies uh, the imbalance of uh, power in local uh, cultural expansions, uh, and uh, this uh, quite uh, similar to uh, the expansions uh, in the colonial uh, era. Uh, after uh, examining, uh, examining uh, this uh, this court, uh, the second step uh, that Nam Kim work. Uh, is to uh, investigate the reality of uh, the past uh, in Dong um, Song culture uh, through excavation uh, at the Go Lao uh, site. The excavation uh, showed that uh, the origin, uh, original uh, rapper uh, had or 
already uh, been consulted uh, before the period of uh, synthetic uh, domination. Moreover, uh, this site uh, was a uh, part of uh, an uh, early civilization of Vietnam, which uh, saw the emergence of uh, urbanism and uh, political uh, uh, centralization. Uh, that means uh, this archaeological uh, data uh, have been uh, used to uh, argue against uh, uh, Western uh, discourse, maybe a Chinese uh, discourse as well, uh, which uh, normally uh, overlooked uh, Southeast Asian uh, pre and uh, proto uh, uh, history and uh, define uh, Southeast Asian cultures uh, as inferior. Uh, furthermore, uh, Nam Kim uh, as uh, that uh, historically, uh, Golau was built uh, as a capital city uh, in the period of uh, foreign independence uh, from the Chinese. And this site uh, was uh, continuously uh, occupied until the uh, late uh, dynasty. Uh, this uh, shows uh, that uh, Golau uh, has been uh, perceived uh, as a central, uh, uh, sorry, uh, as central home uh, for uh, many centuries. This interpretation uh, leads me to uh, consider the idea of a site of memory proposed by uh, the uh, Although uh, the, uh, his concept, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, uh, refers uh, to uh, the modern uh, more uh, memorial uh, sites, uh, it uh, makes uh, me uh, think about uh, how uh, ancient uh, people uh, could have uh, trans uh, transmitted. Uh, their uh, memory to uh, this archaeological site. Uh, furthermore, uh, I am uh, reminded uh, of Xiao Long Han Xiao Long Han's uh, article, uh, who invented uh, 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 who invented uh, the once dumb nationalism uh, politics and as an uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, archaeological debate of uh, the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, which uh, argues uh, that uh, the history of uh, Dong Song uh, Bronze uh, Drums uh, is part of uh, the national uh, narrative of Vietnam, and that their uh, interpretation is a sort of uh, political tension uh, between Vietnam and China. Uh, moreover, uh, Nam Kim's uh, paper reminds uh, me to uh, uh, about like a, a contemporary uh, ac academic issue in Thailand, uh, in which <coughs> uh, Dong Son uh, culture has been used uh, to argue against uh, the Indonesian model. Uh, once dumps uh, are interpreted as a representative of internal trade, uh, cultural networks, and uh, indigenous uh, common uh, belief uh, system of uh, Southeast Asia before the arrival of uh, Indian influence. Uh, this revision uh, reflects uh, the I idea of uh, anti-colonialism uh, and a belief uh, in internal development. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the great contribution uh, of uh, Nam Kim's work is to show us uh, that uh, when we uh, study the past, uh, we should consider the politics of uh, its creation and use. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Ben. Um, yeah, I'd like to say thanks very much to our two speakers today for fascinating talks and to Ashley for inviting me to be a respondent on this panel. Um, it's very interesting to hear about uh, recent developments in the archaeology of early state formation in early Southeast Asia, um, with both of you pushing dates further back uh, for these, these kinds of processes. Um, so the two polities we've looked at today um, arose in different contexts, uh, geographically and chronologically, but um, there are some similarities. Um, the Kolowa polity has now turned it so far, um, developing from local prehistoric precursors, uh, massive ramparts from the third century BC, um, before the arrival of the Chinese in Han period, um, demonstrating Inter, uh, intercultural in, uh, interactions involving the Tian in Yunnan um, and possibly the Nan Yue uh, in Guangzhou. Uh, also connecting an inland route with maritime uh, sphere as well. Um, then with the uh, 
Chandralinga quality um, with these new thermal uh, luminescent states um, at uh, Khao Ka and Sichuan, um, suggesting an earlier date closer to uh, Funan, as it was known to the Chinese. Um, although, uh, Sam, you should correct me if I'm wrong, but the bricks for that particular work, were they from the slope further down uh, from Kilka, but were really in a structural context? Yeah, maybe from the survey, right. if we have no permission to discover it yet. Okay, okay, so it was still very useful. Yes, uh, Can I get you guys to speak up a little bit? Sorry. Just if you can speak a little bit more loudly from where people can't hear. Um, but it, it's obviously very useful uh, to do those analyses at this stage to be able to uh, demonstrate a case for actually uh, taking that work further. Um, but again, we have uh, involvement in different interaction uh, spheres across the Gulf of Thailand and west across the peninsula, um, connecting an inland overland route uh, with the maritime sphere. Um, so there are these, these similarities. Um, I want to, uh, rather than go into um, generalities of what we've talked about, I'd, I'd like to pick on something uh, that you've individually uh, from each of your presentations and something which uh, relates to them both. Um, so, uh, Sam, uh, I was very interested in the, um, the work on the trans peninsula routes um, because, so far as I can tell, uh, very little has actually been done on the ground with these routes. Um, I, I get the sense that much of this work has been done from looking at maps. Uh, and, and I'm interested to know how much uh, work has been done on the ground to actually investigate these routes. Um, I think on the map you showed us, they were labelled as possibly transmit routes. Um, of course, the, the archaeology of uh, trade routes is notoriously difficult to uh, to demonstrate on the ground because uh, people are moving. Um, it will be several days, maybe two or three days, to get across the peninsula, perhaps uh, on foot. But you, you're using rivers as well. Um, but I wonder what the potential is for archaeological uh, truth in these these routes. Um, what what kinds of archaeology we might be anticipating? Um, you know, is it is it temporary settlements? Would we be looking at um, more permanent settlements part way along the routes? And um, you referred in your article to a um, suggestion that uh, ceramics perhaps were not transported across across the peninsula, uh, but rather taken on boats around um, because of their fragility. Um, so think about the kinds of uh, the kinds of goods that might have been transported and what we might what we expect to find in these routes. Um, another aspect, of course, is that because uh, because of the distribution of the um, transport routes up and down uh, the peninsula. In the south, especially, you have um, an international border, a modern international border uh, involved here. So, especially between Azakeha uh, and um, Yaran, um, which may be easier for um, local archaeologists to uh, to investigate. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the UK Foreign Commonwealth Office will appreciate me trying to go to Yaran. Um, but, uh, but also in the north, between southern Myanmar and Thailand. So uh, some of the practicalities and, and things about what, how this might be studied archaeology, archaeologically, and is, it, is it something that could be, could be done? Um, and something I wanted to pick out from uh, Nam's uh, presentation, I, I've I also read your, your book, um, The Origins of Ancient Vietnam, um, which was very interesting and, and very detailed. And, uh, some of the details that were in your presentation, um, you, you didn't really have time to go into a lot of the detail, uh, but absolutely fazinating stuff um, with the uh, stratigraphy of the, of the Rome parks. Um, and you go into a lot more detail there, uh, so sorry for mentioning bits of this in, your, uh, in the presentation. Um, but the, you, you think about the kinds of evidence within this archaeology for um, levels of uh, uh, socio-political complexity and, and whether there's uh, evidence for a state. Um, of course, the, the definition of what constitutes a state is, is part of the uh, underlying issue. But um, 
But uh, you, you, you talk about um, uh, the idea of a, a centralised um, political complex. Um, whether there's evidence for multi-generational longevity of the political institution, which is something that might be associated with a, with a state. Um, and one of the things you, you, you see with your uh, architectural energetics, um, which is very interesting, but the, this, this weighing up of the, uh, the number of um, workers in the labor force and the, uh, the amount of time it takes to actually produce these ramparts. Um, so the more laborers you have, the quicker it is, the less time. But the other way, um, yeah, the fewer laborers, the longer it takes. Uh, but the, the two variables there um, can both, on their own, um, speak of sociocultural uh, complexity. Um, the ability to mobilize a large workforce, or it, it taking so long that there's more than one ruler. Um, and that the, the ideas of uh, what that says about the, um, the, the complexity of the uh, culture. Um, you've also looked at the uh, social stratification, um, the presence of urbanism, which itself can have a variable uh, manifestation. Um, and I was particularly interested in the, in the uh, your, your ideas around the um, evidence for the use of coercion or warfare and how this relates to uh, social political complexity as well. Um, because you, you speak at one point about how um, warfare is a, a, an organised and a legitimised um, coercion. Um, and you've also mentioned that uh, perhaps specialisation, and you showed us within the site, um, centralised control of some production of this, this uh, material, um, the, the crossbow bolts and the, uh, the moulds. Um, and of course, um, one of the uh, there's, there's a couple of um, problems there which you're fully aware of, the things to develop, um, which I suspect will, you know, um, uh, some critics will, will pull on that. Um, so one of those is about the uh, assessment patterns, and you, you mentioned um, the beginnings of uh, you know, study for assessment patterns within uh, Goloa. Um, but I'm also interested to know about um, settlement patterns outside uh, this area. What, what, are the, what are the practicalities and the um, constraints on uh, understanding the settlement patterns? I mean, you mentioned that there's some habitation in there already. Um, but in terms of practical archaeology, are there other things which are um, sort of slowing the development, the understanding of uh, Dongsan um, settlement patterns? Um, and also uh, potentially osteoarchaeological data related to warfare, uh, related trauma. Um, you mentioned in your book that the possible high incidence of cranial trauma especially, um, and what, what there might be in the existing archaeological record uh, for this, <coughs> um, this kind of evidence. And, um, yeah, the, the potential for, for that material to be looked at. Is it, is it that the, the material hasn't been studied in that way, or is it that the uh, it, that, that kind of material and evidence doesn't really survive in, in what is it? Mean? Um, yeah, that's, that's those, those two points, actually one each from your presentations, but there, there's something that I wanted to uh, draw out that relates to both. Um, and that's this idea of the, uh, the Dongsan uh, type drum. And I call it Dongsan type drum because uh, recently there's been some finds uh, in in Thailand, especially, uh, which suggest that there is localities of production outside of northern Vietnam, um, and that that's not to say that uh, you know, northern Vietnam is still you know, clearly a center, the, the main center of production of these these objects. Um, they tend to be talked about in terms of what they tell us about the, uh, the long distance, the, the prehistoric long distance uh, trade networks. Um, but, uh, you know, so at, um, at Kaloa we, we saw this large uh, bronze drum, possibly um, a similar pattern on the ends of the roof tiles, 
um, which is perhaps a, a kind of localization of this uh, of the Chinese tubular roof tiles, um, which relates in, in the context of high status uh, material, both with the drum and the architecture, potentially high status. Um, and then in the southern Thai Peninsula, uh, there were, I think, two, maybe more examples in the Bethany Satellite right area, um, and presumably dating just a few hundred years before the new dates you've derived for uh, these bricks in um, Kaka just a few centuries earlier. Um, interesting is closing that gap. Um, so the, the, the two, oh, oh, sorry, I also meant, wanted to mention what you said about the, uh, how important the uh, Dong Song um, drum is for identity uh, in, in Vietnam. Um, and I know that there have been debates in the past about whether it originated in Vietnam or China. Um, but the, the, two, the two studies um, I just mentioned are uh, Nong Nong Ho in northeast Thailand. Uh, there's a presentation at the 2016 um, Spafa conference in Bangkok um, where some mold fragments um, were found uh, that, that appear to be related to uh, bronze drum production. Um, and another site in uh, Khao Sek in the peninsula of Thailand, um, probably Price and Berlin's Benla, um, drum fragments with very unusual metallurgical characteristics. They have a very high copper um, concentration, which is very different to much everywhere else that's, that's been analysed. Um, I'm not sure quite how to explain it, but the isotopically it relates to uh, ore sources in Laos, in, uh, in Laos, but um, but that doesn't necessarily tell us where it was made. Uh, that's the source of ore, so I can't actually say where it was made. But um, yeah, potentially there were, and as, as this kind of investigation progresses, we may begin to find that um, there are other uh, localities where where these objects were um, were produced. Um, like I say, the, the sheer numbers. There is still this this focus. On, uh, Northern Vietnam. Um, so I wonder what, what you might both uh, say about this, this connection between the uh, what, what this says about identity related to the drums. I, I was interested in your point, Sam, about the uh, the connections between Peninsula uh, Thailand and uh, the opposite coast on mainland Southeast Asia, and this this trade route. Um, are there how were these how were these drums used and how were they how were they perceived between the different communities in terms of is there is there a cultural relatedness here that, that says I oh, recognise the uh, yeah the, the, the system the cultural system that is in operation here um, and how the different communities at some distance to each other how they might relate it because there's a there's a trade connection but potentially there's competition and emulation um, and possibly the impetus to produce uh, your own drum, or whether it's traded there. I'm just interested in your thoughts on how this, uh, how this material affects these, these kinds of um, situations. Okay, we're very, very rich already, and we'll move on to Pamela. Um, okay, so I have some more general comments about the papers, and my comments are quite general. Um, they're definitely not at the level of specificity as those by Kipad and, and Ben. Um, so first off, I um, just wanted to say that I thought it was interesting, and I, I also kind of appreciated this, um, this sense of uh, belonging, I guess, that I, I sort of extracted from both of your presentations, whether it be um, in the form of your, uh, your your sort of personal connections to the material and your motivations for getting into this kind of scholarship, um, whether it be familial, the way your sort of family background sort of drives your interest in studying a particular area of the world and maybe transnational connections, but also um, you know, I have to say with Sam as a former Cornellian, um, the ways in which we are kind of 
indebted to the Cornell School of Art History and uh, the formative influence of Stan O'Connor, in particular, who was um, uh, Sam's co-chair, but also a committee member on, you know, for my dissertation. And I wonder, you know, just something to think about, the ways in which we see ourselves as indebted to these influences, but also the ways in which we, at some point, try to depart from these schools. You know, we get a sense of our formation as scholars, and then we have, I don't know, at moments, a kind of resistance. You know? we, kind of sense the transparency of our formation and we want to sort of break from it a little bit or depart from it. Um, so anyway, that's something I was just thinking about and listening to your two papers. Um, and along those lines, you know, how we situate ourselves within Southeast Asian studies. Um, so going back to the question of area studies um, and just the fact that what we do as art historians, you know, art history has proven to be a rich terrain for the sourcing of materials that support the regional argument, right? especially pre-modern art history. And so there's ways in which that kind of material has been used to define the region out of sort of, you know, passion of scholars, but it's also been a way in which um, it's also material that has been instrumentalized to define the region. And both of you spoke about contemporary initiatives that we can see as embedded in political and economic agendas, right? Um, and the fact that what we do, I think all of us, both of you in your presentations, um, the ways in which that, that regional argument came up. So whether you're working on the specificity of a micro-region in, in sort of the neighborhood of Thailand or you're working in a micro region in Vietnam, it kind of all goes back to Southeast Asia. At some point, Southeast Asia comes in as a kind of broader regional meta narrative. Um, and so hence our sort of existential crisis, the Southeast Asianists, the Southeast Asian art historians or archeologists where we're constantly trying to define the region but we're also constantly trying to undo it in a way. Um, and that makes us Southeast Asianists. <laughs> Um, and so I was just thinking about that too, in terms of, you know, Southeast Asia, there's been a lot of discourse over the last few decades about how we need to debunk this fiction, this unicorn, according to Donald Emerson, I believe. Um, but the pre-modern also comes often, uh, often comes up as a sort of legitimating device for resurrecting sort of the regional body of Southeast Asia. And more specifically, I think, you know, as a fellow sort of Vietnam scholar, <clears throat> thinking about the <clears throat> unique situation of Vietnam within Southeast Asian studies, within Southeast Asian art history, um, but also as something that belongs to the pre-modern Sinosphere and situates itself within East Asian studies. Um, and similarly to you know, these debates about Southeast Asia and some of the seminal, seminal texts that we've read um, that constantly question the construction of Southeast Asia as a region, so too do we have similar moves happening with Vietnam studies. Um, you cited some sources that go back into, I believe, the 60s even, that begin to question this construction of the nation. But it's really, I think, within the last decade or so, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's been a real turnaround in um, our acceptance of the Chinese occupation myth, as Keith Taylor puts it. And you know, a lot of these shifts, I feel like, have been driven by the seminal sort of scholars in the field of Vietnam studies. Keith Taylor is like the eminent historian of the pre-modern Vietnam. And so we, you know, with his new book, um, that sort of revises a lot of the material from his book, The Birth of Vietnam, but even three years ago, was it three or four years ago at a conference we were at, and Keith Taylor gave these closing remarks, and he said it was time to take the Chinese occupation myth and throw it in the trash, or throw it in the rubbish. <laughs> um, and that's been a real sort of change in, I think, the accepted historical structures that Vietnam scholars have been working with for a long time but are still the predominant paradigms of nationalist historiography in Vietnam. You know, the conception of the nation relies upon that myth of occupation. Um, 
So I was thinking about not just something you necessarily have to respond to, but how do we situate ourselves within Southeast, within Southeast Asian studies, within Thai studies, within Vietnam studies, but also within subfields of, well, if we want to think about subfields of those disciplines, or whether those are subfields of art history and anthropology and archaeology, you know, where do we see ourselves within these disciplinary fault lines? And um, leading to the next question, this call for interdisciplinary interdisciplinary work, you know, especially with the pre-modern materials that you know so much of what we have to fill in requires us to use our imagination, as Sam noted. You know, the pre-modern remains this field that is you know sort of constructed through a lot of puzzle pieces and through interdisciplinary work we get to put those puzzle pieces together um, through that those kinds of scholarly collaborations and research projects. Um, But it's also, you know, it's, it requires interdisciplinary work. It also requires transnational work. It, cross, it requires the crossing of these area studies divisions, right? How can we study Vietnam without studying China in some instances? How can we study parts of Southeast Asia without studying India? And so something I was thinking about was, you know, um, how to contend with that need when many, um, difficulties continue to be presented by area studies as we continue to, to institutionalize them as programs or centers in, in you know, universities and research institutes. Um, how do we also contend with the tensions and biases that are results of imperialist and nationalist agendas and those hierarchies that linger based on models of Indianization or Sinicization. I'm thinking as an example of, um, of the ASA, the American Council for Southern and Southeastern Art, where it is, a, it, the council promotes, you know, they have a conference every year, it is primarily South Asian art, um, and Southeast Asia maybe gets one panel. Um, I've presented my own work at East Asia or China oriented conference and I often feel like I'm sort of invited to the table of the of the Chinese scholars or the East Asianists. So Vietnam has this we have this very ambiguous and sort of unstable place in those narratives, despite the fact that we're calling for a better understanding of its entrenchment within this idea of East Asia or Southeast Asia. Um, finally and I think this probably connects to uh, a few of Ben's comments um, in the title of this workshop, this idea of a polity as something that can encompass a multitude of uh, forms of statecraft. And something that came up in your talk, Sam, that sort of revealed, I think, your Cornell training, if I may say so, <laughs> was this real interest in um, the agency of the object and um, you know production as theater, and of course you cited Stan's work on ironworking as spiritual inquiry, and thinking about the ways in which those forms of production feed into notions of early states, if you want to call them that, or early polities, as theorized in what are considered sort of classical paradigms of the mandala <clears throat> and the theater state. So going back to Walters and Gertz. And how we might, you know, how do we then, oh sorry, I wanted to mention too, there's ways in which now your talk as well reminded me of that a little bit in thinking about evidence of complex labor systems as potentially evidence of a kind of agency, a kind of collective agency in terms of a shared imagination or, or a shared will to construct these things in such complex systems. So in line with what I think are Walters and Gertz's models of these political formations, this notion of a, an active sort of collective agency that helps support and structure the center 
I guess, reinforce the center. But then how do we then think about those models in relation to like James Scott, I guess, and the notion of the state and a much more the much more coercive forces that are are at play in terms of reinforcing the state as center. And I guess what that is leading to is this question of agency. To what extent are we using imagination and speculation to project notions of agency into the material record and into process as opposed to object? Um, so that's a very general question, I guess, and that it wraps it up for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all three of you. And uh, it's a lot to take on. I realize you'll probably give a, a few preferred spot answers and not try to respond to everything, but would either of you like to begin? I will begin. <laughs> So first um, question from... I, I'm just going to interrupt for a minute. I think we really need to speak up because we're speaking to each other, but we're also speaking to the crowd. So just encourage everyone you hear me well? with your quiet voices okay. over there. From that corner. <laughs> <laughs> first, I would like to respond to the first question from Ajahn Pipak uh, about the two pages of questions. <laughs> about why, uh, why did it change from Hinduism to Mahayana Buddhism mm -hmm. to Theravada Buddhism and how Islam was important uh, in that area uh, in Peninsula Thailand. First of all, I don't think we have a menu I mean, to choose, like a restaurant. You know, when we went to the restaurant, we can choose a menu for ourselves. I, I, I don't imagine the people in that place of time to have that menu when they choose the religion. It depends on some kind of, you know, it, it can happen organically. Uh, like uh, people arrived in that area, the missionaries, you know, the Hindu uh, priests came to that area, the kinds of social connections, social ties with specific areas between India and Southeast Asia and so on and so forth. The, the, the trade routes, the maritime um, groups that you know, travel around. So um, I think it's more complicated than choosing something from the menu. Uh, it's more complicated than choosing India or China as a model <coughs> to develop uh, something, to develop the statecraft in, in Southeast Asia. However, um, Theravada Buddhism and, and Hinduism are different in this in, in the in the sense of um, state formation. Hinduism is more controlled by uh, the Hindu priest, especially in Sivism. Uh, the Hindu priests have to be the link between uh, the king and the gods, and uh, so the the kings have to share the power with the the, the priest uh, more than the Buddhist monks in Theravada Buddhism. And that's why in the 13th century, I believe, um, in, in Southern Thailand, the king with the new dynasty, with the new kingdoms, with the new networks like Sukhothai, uh, Nakhon Sitomara, and the early Ayodhya period, uh, they chose to, to focus on uh, Theravada Buddhism and, and chose the Lankan school from Sri Lanka to be the, the model for, for that because it gave them more freedom, it gave them more new identity. You know, it's different from uh, the kingdoms in the past that they, uh, that they overcame. Uh, so that's, that's a general question. We can go on and on about this. You know, I, can be, I can give you more information if you have time. Uh, the second one is the charm influence. Uh, because I work in Nakhon Sikamara and, and my essays, <laughs> It's more related to uh, the, the Javanese work. By the way, I thank Leslie for uh, came to me for, for coming to me and, and uh, told me that I, I, I was um, said incorrectly. I, I said too fast about the, the date of the the Janti Janti Suku. It's not 11th century; it's 15th century. Um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so um, the Jam was not. I mean, the influence of Jampa appeared in Shaya, but uh, not so much in, in that particular place 
in the great stupa in the concept of Marat. Mm -hmm. So on that question, I, I can uh, talk more about that too. Mm -hmm. But the Jam people was important, of course, as communities in, in Southeast Asia, I mean, in, in Peninsula Thailand. So moving on to Ben's question about trans-peninsula routes. It's a big question. It has been a debate in in Southeast Asian studies, in, in, in the studies of Peninsula Thailand for a long time. Um, we have two models, basically. One is the, 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 the real function of these peninsula routes or the circum-peninsula routes. So we have trans-peninsula routes or the circum-peninsula routes. Did, uh, did they cross over or did they go uh, around it? We have conclusion more or less among scholars that it, it was used. They, I mean, the transpeninsula routes existed and they were used actually by the people in the past to cross over from one side to the next. But did they, did they use it for transporting bulky goods, like a big shell of goods and, and fragmented goods like uh, ceramics or not? Or did they use it for like traveling? Uh, like using for like walking and, and uh, connecting the, 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 the two courts uh, by people only. Pierre Mong Kang yeah, uh, proposed that it was used for speed. I mean, it's, it's, it's closer if you cross from one side to the next, and only people, not, not goods, I mean, not ceramics, that cross over. And in terms of archaeology, we have to have, like uh, Ben said correctly, asked the, the right question. That, uh, in, in terms of archaeology, if you want to study these kinds of transpeninsula rules, you have to find more evidence you know, on the ground, like the transshipment uh, places. If you transport ceramics uh, across the peninsula, of course, the connecting point, the transshipment points, have to have a bunch of ceramic shirts, and we have not found that yet mm -hmm. on the ridge, I mean, in you know, between the two rivers you know, on both sides. So we still don't have that uh, information. And uh, the similarities between artifacts from one side to the next may be caused by the, the shipments, I mean, the, the, the navigation, the maritime navigation from one side to the next through the Strait of Malacca, and that is quite common as well. So we have this debate still, and we don't have enough evidence, and if we are going to do it, we have to do, uh, we have a, a kind of transnational uh, expeditions, and also we have to have a, a very int intensive uh, um, archaeological expeditions in the future on the ground, especially looking for that transshipment places. Where they, they transport goods from from one uh, rivers to the next uh, river systems. The Dong Son made. Okay, so this is a big question, and maybe Professor Nam Kim can help in that regard as well. But I, when I look at the iconography of bronze drums, uh, they are not the same all over the place. They are different. And uh, they are quite in detail. I mean, they they more elaborate uh, and, and more details in north in in uh, in the northern Vietnam and in China as well. But when it comes down to the marine tumbles, some iconography change. Uh, the details are gone. I mean, strip off the details. And now we have a, a debate about you know. Is it made only in southern Vietnam and uh, in, in northern Vietnam or in southern China only, or it made somewhere else? And you know, evidence started to come up, like the, the things that you mentioned from Sukanya Bauner uh, in Mukdaha in, in the northeastern Thailand, the most uh, probably made for Hegel one bronze drums, uh, and also like in Khao in Khao Se in southern Thailand too. We don't have uh, a lot of evidence right now, but in the future we hope that we have, we probably will have more evidence about the multi centers of production for bronze drums and the iconis, iconographies will have changed from place to place. However, the core iconography are the same. I mean, the, the core structures, the, the, the appearance of it 
the, the sections, the, the, the look of it was, was stay more or less the same. And they were traded too. I mean, like Professor Nam has, uh, has shown us that the, the centers of the production, the, the cluster, were in southern China, in Bien Plateau, and in northern Vietnam. Uh, that's, that's, that's a fact that we see. However, there are some like a kinds of uh, a concentration somewhere else, not as much as the, the ones that we have in the north, in, in the Gulf of Siam too. And um, that's why I mean I try to link that back to the, the neighborhood of you know, looking at the same things, listening at the same things, and have the, have the common visions. And that helped in, in terms of you know, uh, tying people together as well with the with the same um, kinds of culture that we share over the place. However, when we look at these kinds of widespread uh, artifacts or, or artworks, we cannot assume right away that they have the same meanings everywhere. And the meanings change. Uh, and in the Gulf of Siam, the meanings have probably changed as well. I mean, we don't know exactly because they have no records, I mean, written records of that. Uh, however, when people receive it, they, they probably have to change the meanings of it, even though it's the same form, it's the same thing, but the meaning may have been changed from uh, the, to be the symbol of the leaders in northern Vietnam, it can change to something else like the, the symbol of uh, community, uh, unity or, or whatever, I mean, we, we have to study more about that, but what I have been saying today is that uh, it showed that they have common visions more or less. And that common visions continue, not just in the bronze drums, but in the visual in images as well, in other items that we, we will find in the future. I, I try to organize these kinds of evidence together in my later work as well. So uh, I will talk more about that later on. I'll come to Pam's questions. But maybe I will uh, let Professor Nam Kim answer his questions first, and then we can come to the questions about Pan's questions about Southeast Asia as a region, about transnational world or statecraft later on. Uh, well, first I'd like to thank the respondents for, for the, the comments and the questions. There's a lot of food for thought, and I've been writing many things out. I don't think I've a lot of time to go through all of them. Uh, but let me just start with some of the comments people have made. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to bring up would be this idea of memories, and memories associated with sites. Um, how they can be attached to places, but also how they're transmitted through generations uh, across time and space. Um, this is a topic that many people have been exploring within archaeology. Ian Glover, for example, has written a lot on, on this particular topic. Uh, there's also another idea that I'd like to bring into the discussion, this concept of political regeneration. So Ben Bonson had written about this. Um, this idea that you take materials, whether from text, whether from the landscape, artifacts, other kinds of relics, and you use them in different ways as a sort of blueprint for changes in political regimes and dynasties. And we can see this in many examples from world history uh, across regions. And I, I think that's an interesting idea to bring up. I don't know if you had a specific question, but it was more of a comment that I just wanted to, to, to sort of build from. Um, and I find it very interesting how you talk about the uses of the Dong Sun culture material and its material record to argue against those Indianization uh, arguments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's fascinating to think about. I didn't really think about it that way, but it, it is very analogous to how it's being used in northern Vietnam to counter against the Sinocentric sorts of perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it, it brings up that larger point that it's important to, to complement what we already know, the traditional explanations that people have been talking about for decades, um, and use the archaeological record, the material record, in ways that, that can kind of enrich our understanding of that past. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry you had to read my book. <laughs> I hope it wasn't too tedious for you. Uh, but thank you for your, your comments and questions. Um, the idea of the state, for example, what you were talking about, these definitions for state and for urbanism, um, that was something that I, I, I grappled with because, as you pointed out, there are many ways in which we can look at these past entities, these social polities. 
uh, and define forms of complexity. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that you, you brought up that idea of, of coercive power that I do talk about in the book. I didn't have time to really go into the detail here. But for me, uh, a very important criterion for, for what we might consider state-level societies would be that sort of monopoly over the use, the legitimate use of deadly force. And I think there is plenty of evidence from the, the Goldwater case that illustrates uh, not only the centralization of production processes associated with some of those materials, those various bronze differences, but also the weaponry. You know, they seem to be standardized in production. Um, if you think about the rampart features as fortifications, for instance, um, there is a lot of debate about that as well. And I've had people tell me that they think that these features were constructed as part of flood control or irrigation purposes or ritual purposes. Uh, I don't discount those possibilities, not in the slightest. But I would point to the fact that we have these other material indicators as well. The iconography showing uh, warriors on boats, in some cases with captives sitting in front of them, um, the recovery of weapons, the mass production of weapons, the um, various architectural features associated with these ramparts. Uh, I didn't talk about this here today, but we can see evidence of baffling. We can see baffled gates um, where you force your uh, potential attackers to, to move in a certain pattern. There are indications that bastions are spaced not only in the inner wall, but also along parts of the outer and middle walls as well. Uh, and you would not have bastions for any other sorts of purpose except um, to, to use as defensive architecture. And we know that the bastions, from what we can tell, and this is really just in the last year or so we've started to do surveys about this, as indicated from LIDAR data, but also on the ground, ground treatment. But the bastions seem to be spaced at regular intervals. These are not natural features. Um, there are high points that seem to be on top of the ramparts, and they're flanked on the exterior by these pieces of dry area. And they're spaced at a, right around the same distance that you would expect them to be, given the kinds of firing distance you have with the technology. So all of these indicators, to me, speak to the presence of coercive power, the importance of competition in militarism. We don't have a lot of osteological data, unfortunately. The soils are not conducive for that kind of preservation. Uh, I know of one site uh, located in the, the Goloat area, this is a, I believe it's a Dongsan cultural period site, where there is evidence for blood force trauma on one of the, the skeletons that have been found there. Um, but aside from that, there's very little osteological evidence. Um, and to kind of piggyback off of another comment, the, the, the use of the, the drums, and I think you talked a little bit about the centers of production and how they might be tied to identity. And I think this was a question that came up across the board. Um, we don't have, to my knowledge, uh, a lot of evidence for localized production. We do have plenty of evidence for the specimens that have been found in highest concentrations in the Yunnan Plateau in northern Vietnam. But in terms of casting um, artifacts, the molds themselves, from what I understand, um, there's one location. This is the Lunke, Lunke site, the citadel, that dates to the second or third century of the Common Era, uh, where they, archaeologists have found a couple of fragments for drum casting. Um, and to my knowledge, that's the only real evidence for the local production. And what's interesting about that time period is um, we know of these, these ceremonial bronze drums being used in the centuries prior. Um, and this, there are suspicions that when the Han come in, they begin to confiscate many of these drums and recast them into other kinds of things. But they, they basically take away the symbols of power of the locals. And what's interesting to me is that in the second or third century at one of these citadels, there's, a, there's evidence for Han production, or attempts to reproduce these drums, because I think they recognize the symbol of power that they have for the local population. Um, and, and I want to get to some of, and maybe I'll open the discussion for some of the comments that Pamela offered, and we can sort of uh, address them together. But this idea of, uh, of belonging, I, I think it was very interesting, the sense of belonging and are some of our own personal reasons for coming into these, these fields of study. Um, I think it, it illustrates that this, there's a concept that's, that's gaining traction in, in archaeology or archaeological theory in terms of multi uh, There are various perspectives that we ought to be bringing to the table when we're considering some of these questions. Um, and it's not just a matter of the research professional who comes into a situation and asks a certain set of questions, but it's also working with 
locals and descent communities um, who have some kind of stake in this process of interpreting that past. What is important about that past? How are these materials, how are these landscapes um, important? How do we continue to serve some kind of function? And there are different constituencies that, that need to be brought to that table. Um, not only to discuss the research and to interpret and reconstruct the past, but also to safeguard the materials for the future. Um, so there's this, I think, this concept of multi-locality that, that would be important to consider. Um, and something else that you brought up that I think that I think we should both address is this idea of transnational collaboration. So you, you correctly pointed out that for many of these questions, it's quite imperative for us to work interregionally across disciplines, but obviously across borders as well. And in some cases, that's much easier to do than in others. Um, I think you alluded to this this, this challenge working between China and Vietnam, especially when we think about some of the origins of the bronze drum. Um, there are national sentiments that, that have to be navigated. And I, I'm thinking of, of even Korea and Japan, for instance, in archaeology. There are many issues. But I do have hope, because I, I know some of our students in our program have been working on uh, materials like beads, for instance, that have been found in both countries. And probably were not manufactured in either country. They were manufactured elsewhere in Southeast Asia, but they have found their way into these areas. And so they run counter to some of the traditional forms of knowledge that we've had about these kind of contexts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had something you'd like to add about that topic. Yeah, about about transnationalism, I think it's, it's very important, and um, we have to work more together on that. Sometimes, I mean, political issues, contemporary political issues get in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can avoid that, but uh, in the future, Probably we can do that, but I think now I mean the world is moving to the right. <laughs> I mean the right, uh, as a more conservative. In what happened in the U.S.? What happened in Europe? And what happened in I don't know in, in Southeast Asia? Um, I hope that we we will have more liberal governments in the future, and then we can talk more about these kinds of uh, transnational. Um, projects together. In terms of economics, they, they hold hands. But in terms of identities, I mean, they fought a lot because I'm now working at SPAFA, trying, trying to promote the, the identities of Southeast Asian peoples together through culture. And sometimes it's quite difficult because sometimes we have to fight um, for the, the kinds of recognitions from UNESCO. UNESCO have three brands, the World Heritage Site, uh, ICH, uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage, and the World Memories. So these are like award to, to the countries or to the two countries together to, uh, to be recognized as having something important for UNESCO. And for the, for example, like ICH, the, the Intangible Cultural Heritage, Thailand had to fight with Cambodia over the corn dance. And, and that is quite, <laughs> I don't know, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, Priyavi here is another example, which is very, it's, it's create more conflict than, than unity. So I, we have to think about that too, uh, in terms of how modern politics get in the way when we talk about this transnational uh, research project together. And I agree with Pam that uh, interdisciplinary approach and interdisciplinary kinds of investigations are inevitable nowadays. Um, art historian students cannot be art historian only. You have to know other methodology as well. You have to know about, I mean, how to use other evidence, other kinds of records, other kinds of disciplines to fulfill your gaps in, in, in your research too. Thank you. I think maybe we should um, open it up to the floor um, so that we can all go to the reception before somebody else eats it or drinks it, whatever's over there. Um, so there's a lot to think about. Um, send your hands now. Yeah. Do I have a, a bit of a broad question? Um, well, I mean, Dr. Kim, you, you mentioned um, saying you, you won't believe in the existence of this national hero until you see a tomb. Like basically, you want to see a corpse. And it just made me think about how um, 
these are talking about uh, of using um, uh, traditional chronicles as a means of, of excavating, basically excavating history. Uh, and these narratives are always driven basically by, by personalities, right? by kings or by, by, by these great figures, great men usually. Um, and I mean, to what extent does, does these, you know, because obviously um, the personalities are, 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 how, are how the narratives are constructed. Um, this, you know, in terms of methodology, does, does archaeology try to, to go against these uh, very individualized kind of kind of narratives, or I mean, you know, or um, does it try to you know make make things more um, uh, democratic and or egalitarian in that sense, or, or do you find yourself still trying to to shore up these um, sort of very centralized or very very personalized? Yeah. Um, that's a very interesting question. It, it speaks to, I think, a couple of tensions um, that archaeologists interpreting these kinds of contexts will face. Um, at, at a very simple level, um, it's difficult for us to get into the heads of those that lived in the past. And we, while we might hypothesize about various kinds of strategies and leadership, um, what, I, what, what I'm proposing today, I have to do at a sort of group level. Because I don't know, I don't know what an individual person, how that person, he or she may have thought or behaved in these conditions, in these contexts. Um, unless we're looking at someone's grave, for instance, it would be difficult to say anything about a specific individual or remains of a person, or if it's in writing something. So, without that kind of evidence, it's difficult to project and to, to think about those kinds of questions. Um, but at the same time, the there is a need to discuss these kinds of strategies and how they might relate to political relationships. And I think the evidence lends itself to those kinds of considerations. If we know that certain material classes are used in a way uh, by various societies, and if we see those same kinds of materials in a different place and it's restricted, I think it allows us to say something about segments or factions or whatever kinds of groupings you want to call them and how they may be using these materials, you know, what kinds of strategies might be going through their heads collectively in that kind of decision making. It's difficult to talk about individual people. Um, and for me, again, I, I'm comfortable uh, talking about a, a general sense of the polity, but what the polity actually looked like and how it operated, it's very difficult for us to say. Um, I prefer to stay on this, this generic level for now. As we uncover more and more evidence, maybe we can speak to specifics, but it, it's difficult to, to delve into that too much. Can, you, can, I, can I follow up, perhaps, it intersects a bit with what Conan was, was getting at. Um, it seemed to me that there, you, you're, you're assimilating to some degree. I was, I, was, I, was, I was surprised that you maintained the term civilization hmm. to begin with, yeah. and that there's an assimilation, or a suggested assimilation between um, civilization, whatever that is, polity, the state, uh, complex forms of society, those, those all seem to be on the same level, such that the definition of civilization, I'm wondering if the, the lingering term, your lingering usage of civilization is something of a relic of the uh, of the China versus barbarian question, yeah. and, and if, it, if it really has its place there. Yeah. Insofar as it appears to be the notion of civilization appears to be underpinned by a notion of collective sensibility. Hmm. For state, early state formation, that makes all the sense in the world to me. Yeah. But for civilization, I wonder why it's there. Yeah. And is that somehow oriented towards dealing with these questions of kings forming worlds, and that's the definition of civilization? Why can't uh, an an individual in their own culture, as part of a collective culture, as part of an individual relationship to whatever it may be, the home, the pond, whatever, it may be. why is that not civilization? Um, why is it only state polity that, or some form of state, which can be called civilization? So I know these are big debates right. within archaeology as well, the notion of civilization, so I'm wondering if you're yeah. engaging in this. Thank you for pointing that out, because it, 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 it has not dawned on me that it, in some ways I, I do conflate these terms. Um, but I guess the way I would respond to that is my, my view of 
the phenomenon of a civilization is not restricted to something that is a state. It's not restricted to forms of politics, for instance. It's, it, 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 it's used in a loose sense here that we have shared cultural affinities between various societies or communities that are in this region. So we might say that the civilization in question would be something like the Dongsan culture, mm -hmm. material culture. So this is a, an archaeological horizon or a lens of some kind. We can see shared affinities in material culture, presumably in cultural practice as well, that's uh, spread out geographically across this region, but also through space and time as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not directly related to the global polity. For me, there is a separation here when I'm talking about polity. Um, civilization can include cities, it can include the hinterland, it can include small villages. It's part of whom, whomever might be part of that larger collective of cultural practice. So and that's how I would distinguish in terms of terminology. But you're right to point out that it, there is a lot of debate of, about this. Um, so when I use the term polity, I'm referring to this, this apparatus of, of, of authority or governance that may be making some of these decisions may be related to some of the political elites located at the site. I'm not referring to the rest of northern Vietnam or to um, these, these various communities because we don't really know. We don't know the extent of its influence or its reach, uh, physically or ideologically. Those are questions that we don't have an answer to. I mean, at this point, we don't even know what kinds of languages, for sure, were being spoken by these disparate groups. It could be that there are multiple ethnicities or ethnic linguistic landscapes. So it's a very complicated situation. Mm -hmm. Just a very quick simple question. Uh, what are the current critique on archaeology itself? Because looking at the title archaeology at a crossroad and the way uh, both gentlemen that we were talking about, it seems like archaeology is put to a service of almost a certain type of political economy, a service of political economy or even in uh, cultural politics as in how I think uh, Dr. Corey has basically ask that very fundamental question of archaeological practice within the region in that sense. Right? What is the current critique towards archaeology? I mean, there have been critique towards anthropology as a kind of very um, almost West academic dominant uh, worldview in that sense, but what is the critique of archaeology? And, uh, in general, and within this, this, your research of this region, I just very quick question. Yeah, to both of, them, both of you, if you can. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, I'd say there, there's, a, there's a sort of evolution, uh, if you will, in how archaeology is being conducted, the kinds of questions that are being asked. And there was a slide that I showed up here early on from the 1960s, the inaugural issue uh, from the Institute of Archaeology. Many of those questions that were being asked, if you looked at every title on that table of contents, they were all dealing with these, these meta narratives and the, the connection between archaeology and history. Um, and if you look at that journal today, the table of contents is very different. And we're looking at um, questions that go well into the Pleistocene all the way through to the present time. We're looking at not just northern Vietnam, but all over the country. And it's not really tied to these national historiog historiographical um, constructions any longer. There's still, some element, there's still some element of that. But I think the researchers, the archaeologists in Vietnam have increasingly recognized, and a lot of them are collaborating with people from outside of Vietnam who are asking different kinds of questions, using various methods to get at these questions. And I think once people start realizing there are other questions that might be of interest, and there are ways to get at that data, um, whether it's um, archaeobotanical materials, faunal analyses, other kinds of methods that can help you reconstruct different aspects of that past, now it's not just a matter of defining the culture and the time and place that you can relate to the historical. Now you can ask other kinds of questions as well. And I think the collaborations have moved in that sort of direction. Is that sort of what you're getting at? Okay. Yeah, for me, I mean, archaeology has evolved as well. I mean, in the past, of course, it has been used as part of the nationalistic endeavor. You know? uh, the, the example that we have in Thailand, like in the past, Prince Damrong has you know, rejected the term Khmer art. Uh, from the French scholars, but call it luxury art instead. For example, it's, it's a kind of art, you know, Khmer actually, here in Thailand. Uh, but he called it differently. Uh, and uh, the whole archaeological operations at that time were like were, were, were directed toward creating a kind of 
high nationality and all that kind of things, civilizations. Um, however, now we, the, the questions change. Even the finance department have different questions for, for, for this. So yeah, we, we have changed to looking at something uh, in details, more like question based, more associated with multi ethnic groups, uh, like uh, Nam said. Thank you. Just a quick question about uh, the law. Um, the reconstruction of what it could look like in the future uh, implied a lot of canals throughout the city. Um, so is there any, any evidence for these? Or, or is it pure fantasy on the part of some somebody who thinks this, this would make a great theme park? Uh, there is some evidence. Uh, we have um, parts of the site during the rainy season to get flooded. Um, reconstruction, some hydrological reconstruction indicate that there are boats that are being fed into the site um, through various openings and various reservoirs. Some of it I think might be uh, aspirational, um, but there is, there is reconstruction that indicates uh, the local river that was connected to the river did come in at one point. It, it doesn't any longer, but it did come in at one point. Um, and it fed the outer boat in the various boats within the site, so much so that you would be able to move materials on boats throughout the site. Um, the legendary accounts do talk about some of these uses of boat travel within the site. I don't know how much of that is, is true or not. Uh, but, but there are some indications. Look really Chinese, the way it was, <laughs> the way it was depicted. Yeah. Um, except for the irregular shape, I think. Yeah. Um, which many people suspect, and I suspect this as well, it really conformed to local terrain and topography. Uh, it was expedient use of the terrain. So you connect hilltops or high levels of elevation, um, and it, pre it precluded the need to marshal even more resources in order to build these, these uh, features. But we're, we're still just scraping the surface, I think, for understanding why this particular location, what is it about the topography, what is it about how water uh, may have been moving through this area, how they want to har harness that and channel the, the water resources there. Thank you. 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 Thank
and how it's not always tied to physical power, but it's also tied to ideology. So if we consider the ways in which people may be conceiving of identity and how they may belong to something, uh, the power of ideology is very important to consider as well. Is it? Yeah, no, I, I guess I'm, I'm still thinking about the extent to which we can see the, this participation, I think is a good mm -hmm. way of thinking about it. Is it non-coercive participation? Right. I mean, even if it's coercive vis-a-vis -vis ideology, how do we know it's not coercive in terms of actually extracted labor, like forced labor? You know, I guess I wonder how do we know? But the question then would be, does that counter the notion of a sense of collectivity, even if it's done through a process of resistance or through a process of, of yeah. pure coercion, ideological or, yeah. or uh, real? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's not a, a sense of collectivity developed in the, in the process. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, the short answer, of course, is we, we simply don't know for this mm -hmm. case at this time. Yeah. We don't know the data that is. Right. But we, we do have a, a huge literature and a huge body of literature about this continuum from uh, coercion to collaboration. A kind of, you know, it's a, it's a literature called like, the power strategies in archaeology. So archaeologists have asked these kinds of questions for a long time. It's part of the political economy framework, Marxism and political economy, and then looking at the power strategies. Because now, I mean, the, the whole question is about state formation. It's not about what state came first. It's not about the primary and secondary states, but how the states operate. And uh, like Nam has been doing in his work, he has been uh, trying to look at how it is operated. I mean, those power strategies, the monumentality of the, the, the earthen walls and all that kinds of things. Um, so in these kinds of uh, questions, we have, uh, I mean, archaeologists have proposed that it's not just into all questions, but it's a con continuum. You know, in each society, because each society uh, have unique characteristics, and each society we have some of them we have like very uh, coercive kinds of technique from the leaders. Some would have like looser technique of leadership. Um, so these kinds of you know, leadership strategies or power strategies have been a huge debate in, in archaeology, and each articles would try to prove it using different kinds of evidence. I just went to Stonehenge, by the way, <laughs> and then I, I read the information that they, they found uh, pig bones, bones of the pigs, from Scotland, in, in the Stonehenge. So it means that people came all the way you know, to, to participate in these Stonehenge ceremonies of feasting or whatever. So it's more, it's more than leadership of one ruler, I think it's more like community, kind of sense of belonging. Uh, that you know, this Stonehenge things is is part of us. is 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 our uh, sacred place. Mm -hmm. So the sense of sacredness can be included in that kind of um, questions or explanations as well, not just leadership. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would also add that what we're dealing with are snapshots of time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So these strategies, the the feelings, the, the perceptions of the site and of the community, they change. They continue to change. I mean, they might be changing on a daily basis for all we know. So I don't think that we can rule out that at some point in time groups would have felt a certain way, but that how, how interactions change, yeah, they could change as well. Yeah. Okay, I think on that note, we can thank you all very much for your time, for your thoughts, and, and to all of you as well. And please do join us uh, next door for a drink and for more informative conversation. Thank you. Thank you.